Hello and welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. This is the show where we take all of the news, the good bits and the bad, give them a stir and deliver up a feast of analysis and opinion. Our, our news reviewers will be joining us here in the studio. We will also be live in Tinseltown ahead of the Oscars. But first, the headlines. More lives lost than saved. The findings of a damning report into Steak Knife, the British agent acting as a spy inside the provisional IRA. Reports of deaths on the ground after parachutes failed to open on a Gazan airdrop. The Education Secretary comes out swinging as Gillian Keegan says she'd be happy to punch an Ofsted inspector. Also tonight, there will be no May by December, as the former Prime Minister confirms she is standing down as an MP at the next election. Hello from Universal Studios in Hollywood, where we're going to be previewing the 96th Academy Awards, as well as hearing live from some of this year's nominees. Uh, we have plenty from our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer coming up throughout the show. Uh, we are also joined by our brilliant news reviewers Andrew Jimson and Aisha Hazarika talking us through the biggest stories of the week. And we might just give a mention uh, to these two, described by Labour as the chuckle brothers of decline following a budget that failed to register a single rabbit, let alone any hats. And Following his State of the Union address, has Joe Biden done enough to persuade the jaded US electorate to give him four more years in the White House? In the week, of course, that Donald Trump locked up the Republican nomination. Plus, in the sport, Anthony Joshua is back in the ring tonight, taking on the MMA star Francis Ngannou. But will a win for AJ finally lead to a fight against Tyson Fury? Great to have your company. We are here for the next three hours. Hold on tight. It's Friday. Night. Evening all, an investigation into a British mole inside the IRA has concluded his actions probably resulted in more lives being lost than saved. Freddy Scapatici, codenamed Steak Knife, headed an IRA unit whose job was to kill informants. But an investigation found strong evidence of very serious criminality by him and criticised the security forces for failing to protect those at risk. Our senior Ireland correspondent David Blevins reports now from Belfast. This is Freddy Scapatici, an IRA enforcer turned British spy, the golden goose of agents, according to one defence chief. But a seven-year investigation found that more lives were lost than saved by the mole they codenamed Steak Knife, a damning indictment of intelligence gathering. It put lives at risk. It left those on the front line exposed and let down. And it fostered a maverick culture for some where agent handling was sometimes seen as high stakes, dark art, and was practiced off the books. The report calls on the UK government and the Republican movement to apologize, the onus falling on the first minister. I am sorry for all the lives lost during the conflict without exception. Regrettably, the past cannot be changed or can, cannot be undone. Neither can the suffering, the hurt, or the political violence of conflict be disowned by Republicans or indeed by any other party to the conflict. Scabatici ran the IRA's so-called nutting squad, rooting out alleged informants for torture and murder. Unmasked in 2003, he denied the claims. I'm telling you I'm not guilty of any of these allegations. But couldn't escape the headlines in Belfast and entered witness protection in England, where he died last year. Freddy Scavatici exemplified the dirty war between the IRA and British intelligence, a murky world of espionage where some turned a blind eye to murder, dark secrets that Steak Knife has taken to his grave. Sandra Peake, who works with bereaved families, says they live with the shame of having their loved ones labelled traitors. I mean, I've often said, David, that when your loved one is killed at the hands of the, of the other community, support is often there. But when your loved one's killed at the hands of people within your own community and with a label, it becomes a stigmatised death, and that's something which is very difficult for families to deal with. A lawyer for relatives says it's clear the state and IRA conspired together to murder. Today's report presents as a damning indictment on the state. The staggering takeaway message 
is that the state could have and should have intervened to save lives. That this didn't happen is legally and morally reprehensible. And the 200 pages leave one question unanswered. How much has changed in terms of how British intelligence operates now? David Blevins, Sky News in Belfast. Up to five people are reported to have died after an airdrop of aid over Gaza went wrong. Reports say that parachutes failed to open, leaving the cargo to crash into the waiting crowds. Well, the incident happened on the same day the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, confirmed that the UK will be involved in an American-led operation to build a temporary port in Gaza and open a sea corridor from Cyprus. Well, the World Food Programme says hunger has reached catastrophic levels in the north of Gaza, where children are dying of hunger-related diseases. The young and old are most affected, with one in six children under the age of two suffering from acute malnutrition. Currently, around 150 trucks are entering the Strip each day. But the World Food Programme says a minimum of 300 are needed per day to meet people's most basic needs. At the moment, however, aid can only be brought in through two crossings in the south of Gaza, Rafa and Kerem Shalom, uh, with small amounts of aid being dropped by plane. The new plan will see the Cypriot port of Larnaca become a logistics hub with a temporary port built by the Americans in Gaza, likely near the current one in the north of the Strip. Sky's Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports. A week ago, 10-year-old Yazan al Kafana was being comforted by his mother at a hospital in Rafa. His face is gaunt, his eyes and cheeks sunken in hunger. He's almost too weak to cry out, but the pain is clear on his face. Three days later, Yazan died, another victim of malnutrition in Gaza. I lost my son due to malnutrition, due to the circumstances we're going through in Gaza. What are you expecting from a sick child living in such conditions? How can he get better? America's plan to bring aid into Gaza by sea is another sign of growing frustration with its ally, Israel, and the prospect of widespread famine. One option could be something like this, a floating pontoon stretching some distance offshore into deeper waters and away from the threat of fighting on land. This is from a US exercise a few years ago, but experts say that it will take weeks to get it up and running. It is a medium-term solution to an immediate crisis. I think it will take at least an, a couple of weeks um, perhaps even uh, four weeks, six weeks. Um, it's, it's not that easy to get these. Um, I think it will be mostly floating devices with anchors that you want to put there in front of, uh, of the coast. The aid will need to be received in a secure zone and it will need organisations to distribute it to avoid scenes like these. Britain has now announced its involvement. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was in Cyprus today to inspect the port at Larnaca and said that a ship would sail to Gaza imminently. Food was being loaded up with the aim to land up to 200 pallets a day on Gaza's beaches. Despite all the challenges, and this is truly inspiring, we are now very close to the opening of the corridor, hopefully this Saturday, this Sunday. And I'm very glad to see that an initial pilot operation will be launched today. Aid drops continued over Gaza today, but it is inefficient and risky. Multiple people were reportedly killed in the north when a parachute malfunctioned, turning desperately needed aid into a dangerous projectile. Land crossings are by far and away the best way to get aid into Gaza in the quantities needed. But the international community says Israel must still do more. The chances of premature babies surviving in Gaza now is slim. They are kept alive in the few incubators still working, but their mothers are often unable to feed them, too malnourished themselves. Outside this small, 
rare bubble of hope. Everyone else is fighting for survival. The weakest and smallest, as always, are the most vulnerable. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News. There has been widespread condemnation by politicians following the vandalisation of a portrait of Lord Balfour. Uh, well, this video, shared by Palestine Action, shows the demonstrator defacing and slashing the historic painting which hangs at the Uni University of Cambridge's Trinity College. A Foreign Secretary back in 1917, Lord Balfour signed the declaration supporting a national home for Jewish people in what was then known as Palestine. Cambridge police say no arrests have been made so far. Now, the Education Secretary has said she would have liked to punch a group of Ofsted inspectors. Speaking at an education conference, Gillian Keegan said she had been told by one school just how rude inspectors could be. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say... I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said... They told me how the Ofsted, you know, their Ofsted experience had gone, and I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. I mean, you expect people to be rude to you when you're a politician. You kind of sign up for that. But, you know, when you're kind of trying to run a school and educate children and change lives, you don't expect somebody to come in and not be respectful. Our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, is in Westminster. Evening, Tamara. I mean, I've got to say, it's not the traditional response to an off uh, to an uh, to an Ofsted investigation. Uh, no, there was quite a lot of surprise at Gillian's comments about punching somebody at this head teachers conference today. To give you a flavour of some of the reaction uh, to what the education secretary said, uh, we've heard from the leader of the FDA union, which represents senior civil servants, including those at Ofsted, the school's uh, watchdog. Uh, he said it was completely unacceptable and. Imagine the outcry if a civil servant had said they wanted to pun punch a minister for behaving disrespectfully. We've also heard uh, from Mike Short at the Unison Trade Union saying clearly there's much that can and should be improved at Ofsted, but making light of violence in schools when staff are increasingly likely to face assault doing their job, he said, is in very poor taste. And we've also heard from Labour's Bridget Phillipson, who said the Education Secretary should focus on improving Ofsted, not, she said, punching working people. So, yes, not what you traditionally hear at a head teachers conference. They were talking, of course, about Ofsted in the context of the big changes they have promised to make after the tragic suicide of the head teacher, Ruth Perry. And uh, speaking to sources close to Gillian Keegan, they say, look, it was a light-hearted remark. Obviously, she wasn't uh, advocating punching anyone, and it was in the context of a speech in which uh, she was praising, she said, the amazing work that teachers and head teachers are doing and understanding the struggles that they are going through to try and recruit and retain good staff. This is a school that she visited in her constituency at some point since becoming Education Secretary and uh, was apparently shocked at the tone that the inspectors took and her department say that she's already uh, made some quite big strides towards reforming uh, Ofsted, they say, and that she has a good relationship with its new boss, Martin uh, o Oliver Martin, who was actually at that conference and also speaking there. Tamara, thank you. Time for a quick look at some of the day's other stories. And the Metropolitan Police officer charged with murdering 24-year-old Chris Cabba in South London has been publicly named. 40-year-old Martin Blake shot Mr Cabba through a car windscreen in Streatham in September of 2022. He has pleaded not guilty. Mr Cabba's family made a statement outside the Old Bailey. Police cannot and should not be above the law. Accountability for police officers and forces involved in death, even where evidence of criminality and wrongdoing is identified, is extremely rare. In any other murder trial, the accused would be publicly named. This case should be no different. We welcome today's decision to name the officer. Inquest and the family are not able to comment any further at this stage. Thank you. Uh, the Police Federation, which represents officers, released a statement uh, saying this. The Metropolitan Police Federation and the colleagues we represent are hugely shocked, uh, hugely shocked, saddened and concerned over the decision to name the firearms officer involved in this incident. Being a firearms officer in London is one of the world's toughest jobs. 
officers who volunteer for the role know the responsibility and accountability that comes with it. A woman accused of killing her newborn baby says she feels responsible for the death of her baby daughter. Constance Martin told a jury that she and Mark Gordon bought duvets and hats to keep warm while living in a tent on the run. They deny manslaughter. An 11-year-old boy has been arrested on the M1 after being found towing a suspected stolen caravan. North Yorkshire police say they stopped a BMW towing the vehicle yesterday afternoon near Thirsk after receiving a report that a caravan had been stolen. The boy was arrested on suspicion of a number of offences, including theft, burglary and dangerous driving. He has since been released on bail. Theresa May has announced that she will be standing down at the general election. She was Britain's second female Prime Minister and has been in Parliament for 27 years. Rishi Sunak described her as a fiercely loyal MP and as defining what it means to be a public servant. We are living through an important moment in our country's history. Brexit means Brexit and we're going to make a success of it. No deal is better than a bad deal. We agreed that the government should call a general election to be held on the 8th of June. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. In order to get the best deal for Britain, we need to ensure we've got that strong and stable leadership. I am today announcing that I will resign as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. I was drying the tears there myself. Uh, let's bring in the panel tonight with us for the next two hours, the biographer of Boris Johnson and, of course, contributor to Conservative Home, Andrew Jimson, and Aisha Hazarika, broadcaster and former Labour advisor. Great to have you both here. And, look, before we, before we move on, let's, let, let's spend a moment, I think, uh, dwelling on, on the legacy of Theresa May, someone who could have left Parliament uh, immediately after leaving Downing Street, as people so often do. She, she stayed on. Andrew, your thoughts? Well, that's to her credit that she stayed. And one does want the experience of people who struggled, in her case, struggled fairly much in vain with the difficulties of high office. Mm. It's, it was a good thing that she stayed. And everyone thought, even while she was Prime Minister, that she was palpably doing her best. It just turned out that her best wasn't, wasn't quite good enough. Mm, that's true. I mean, has, has Theresa May, to an extent, been, been rehabilitated then, do you think? In the I think it's only because the, of the absolute plummeting levels of quality that then came after her. And mm. just watching that clip again, where at the end you hear her voice break, you hear that crack in her voice, that's very different to how, you know, her successors left office. You know, Liz mm. Truss still sort of thinks she deserves to be in Downing Street, as does... Boris Johnson, I think two things can be true about Theresa May at the same time. I think the way she conducted herself after she left office, mm -hmm. I agree with Andrew, she made some very powerful interventions. I think she conducted herself well. It can also be true that she leaves quite a mixed legacy when you look at things like the Windrush mm -hmm. scandal when you and the hostile environment, when you look particularly at police cuts, she was Home yeah. Secretary for a long time. Um, you know, I think there's a big mixture of, of views and also how she handled things like Grenfell as well. So I think it, it's a mix, but it's it's a nuanced picture. I mean, just to, just to, to conclude there, Andrew, I mean, does, does, does Theresa May then bear responsibility for, for what happened next, what, what came after? Well, our system is that that's the main function of the Prime Minister, mm. is, is to take the blame. Yeah. Um, but she's not entirely to blame for what happened next. Except that you could say, had she sorted out Brexit, then what happened next would not have happened. Mm. So well, luckily we had the great states from Boris Johnson. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness. Strength in depth there. <laughs> a rare moment of cards <laughs> between the panel this evening. Um, but let's move on, because there's a huge story taking place elsewhere. Uh, stars, writers, directors and all of their entourages, I will guess what, they are heading for Hollywood for this weekend's Oscars. And several nominees could well be making Oscar history if they win a statue on Saturday night. After taking her dress, her very spangly dress, to the dry cleaners, Sky's arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer is live for us at Universal Studios. Katie, good to see you. You must be giddy with excitement already. 
Oh, look, this is my, my season. I love award season, and we're getting closer to the big event as we speak. We thought we'd treat you, Neil, to some Friday light, night Hollywood glamour, though. We're here at Universal Studios. More TV shows and films are shot on this lot than anywhere else in the world. I think behind me, stage 33, they're currently shooting uh, the US version of The Voice. You may, if this looks familiar to you, this Western set behind me, they've shot loads of films here before, but the most recent one that they did here, which lots of people remember, was Quentin Tarantino. Tino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, so, yeah, the reason we've come to Universal Studio in Hollywood, though, is because Universal are have the film that everyone's talking about. They were the ones that put the money into Oppenheimer, which is dominating the awards uh, conversation ahead of the big day on Sunday. Look, we'll get to that in a minute, but what do you need to know ahead of the, the ceremony this Sunday? Um, look... Torrential rain was one thing. We got off the plane last night and it was raining so badly in a very British fashion that they had to actually shut the Oscars red carpet. It looks like it's brightening up now. It's not meant to be raining on Sunday, but these things do. They're so not used to rain like we are in, in the UK that these do cause major disruptions to things like the Oscars. The other thing that is, has got the potential to cause disruption on Sunday is we know that LAPD has said they've drafted in a lot of extra security because they are anticipating, they've heard reports that there could be some uh, protests over the Israel-Gaza uh, war. We know that uh, those protests that happened at the Grammys a few weeks back, they were able to really slow down uh, the movement of stars getting to the Grammys. We're thinking that they are planning, uh, or the, certainly the police are preparing in case that's a similar uh, situation this Sunday. It is a huge logistical task to actually get those celebrities inside the Dolby Theatre on time uh, and they really don't need anything else to slow them down. But look, Oppenheimer is the story and I, I read a really good um, uh, article over the weekend uh, talking about how for Christopher Nolan he has yet to actually win an Academy Award. He's uh, been nominated eight times and it does feel though because so many people are confident that he's going to be taking home Best Director this weekend that it seems less of a competition more of a coronation, really, for him. It does certainly give that impression. He is one of the most bankable directors in Hollywood. I think if Oppenheimer wins Best Picture, it will be uh, one of the highest-grossing Best Picture nominees in the last 20 years. Will it do it? I mean, look, we've had surprises in previous years. We, we get confidently uh, talk about sort of thinking that we know who the big winners are going to be. certainly does feel like this is Christopher Nolan's year, but, of course, we will find out on uh, Sunday itself. But, look, over the next couple of years, a couple of years, a couple of um, hours, we're going to be uh, talking to a few of this year's nominees and look, bringing you some sunshine here in Hollywood. Yeah, th yeah, thanks very much, Katie, for reminding me that I'm stuck in a dark studio at night in London. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, right. Uh, let's bring in our guests at this point, Andrew and Aisha. I mean, look, don't, don't, I'm not going to be asking because I know you're not the world's biggest uh, cinephile, but, I mean, it, it, when was the last time you watched the Oscars ceremony? Because I have to admit, I kind of veer between... The last time I did watch was when Will Smith was up uh, for an Oscar. That was and, epic. and on charges as well, yeah. What do you watch? I, I do quite like dipping into it, and I think I will watch this year because I do feel that cinema has had such a revival this mm -hmm. year and the sort of big box office hits like... Um, obviously Oppenheimer and Barbie as well, have made it, you know, quite cool to go back to the, the cinema. We went through an age where we were obviously COVID and mm -hmm. streaming everything. So I quite like the idea of going back to the cinema. I've definitely gone to the cinema a lot more since sort of mm -hmm. Barbenheimer um, came out. So I'm going to be... I, I do think the other thing that um, Katie mentioned as well was... It'll be interesting to see how much Gaza and this conflict yeah. does. I have a feeling that it will actually... Because they try to make these things quite non-political, mm. but I do feel that this will kind of come up quite a bit. Yeah, I, I don't know that the Hollywood stars up for an Oscar will be able to resist, do you, Andrew? <laughs> Perhaps not. I think the last one I watched was a clip of Billy Wilder, actually. At a... <laughs> <laughs> Not live. <laughs> that's, that's an awful lot. There's but, an awful lot of people Billy under the age of forty came, going, came, going came, to Google came right now. via Berlin as a very young man. Babelsberg was a really big, really big European centre mm. of filmmaking. Uh, then, of course, he went off and made all these brilliant movies in, in America. Will, the, will we have Oscars? Actually, it's something as big as the Oscars one day in London because our film industry is, is, well, getting, the is getting, big, getting bigger going great, and bigger. It's going great, guns. Indeed, it was mentioned in the budget, the which budgets. will be something that we'll be yes. talking about in, in, in a little while. Yeah. Uh, our thanks uh, to Andrew and Aisha just for now. Uh, but we have got plenty more uh, coming up, including was the budget a giveaway or an election letdown? We'll be discussing the fallout from the Chancellor's statement.
I'm Martha Kalner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. Legal abortion! It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Gillian, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. Uh, ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Uh, welcome back to Friday Night. With me tonight and discussing the week's news, the biographer of Boris Johnson, contributor to Conservative Home, Andrew Jimson, and Aisha Hazarika, broadcaster and former Labour advisor. What are we talking about? Well, let's start with politics. And with just months to go until the general election, the Chancellor used this week's budget to try and woo voters. But Labour says the country can't afford his promises, and even some of his own side were somewhat underwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> We can now help families not just with temporary cost of living support, but with permanent cuts in taxation. The Chancellor says it's a tax cutting budget. Was it? Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. I commend this statement to the House. Yeah, it's lower. OK, so yeah, it's a tax cutting budget versus the tax plan last time around. However, the line's still going up. So what do you make of the budget? Overall, I think it lacked something vivid to uh, tell the British people that we're on their side and that work really pays. And so, as a result, I do think it wasn't enough, ultimately. I don't think that any voters want gimmicks. In terms of content, no rabbit out of the hat, no surprises. I think the fundamental reason why they support the Conservative Party is because they trust us to be sensible with the economy. That was absolutely farcical. Vote well, loser, I'm afraid. I cannot see this doing anything to persuade people to vote Conservative at a future election. Conservatives know lower taxes mean higher growth. They clearly don't have a line to go on, and something like that cuts through all the percentages up, percentages down and everything else. This is a tax cut that is good for growth. That's a big divide with the Labour Party. Uh, they think that you grow the economy by spending more. We think you need to bring down taxes. This government is very much giving with one hand, but taking actually double in the other hand. And that is why working families, people all across our country, are worse off. Government and opposition are joining in a conspiracy of silence in not acknowledging the scale of the choices and trade-offs that will face us after the election. They and we could be in for a rude awakening when those choices become unavoidable. Oh, well, let's get the thoughts of our panellists. Andrew, we'll come to you first. No rabbits out the hat. So what is your view of, of the way in which this budget has gone down? Well, it hasn't 
change things, but what will change things? Mm. Uh, and, and there's this entrenched idea at, at Westminster that, and indeed far beyond Westminster, that they're going to lose. And uh, people don't think about it that much. Uh, they're, they're, people are not, not going to sort of go, swing around like weather vanes just because of a, this budget. But I thought it was, it was professional, craftsmanlike. Um, I think he did about the... He played weak cards about as well as they could be played. Mm. Well, I, I, I suppose the fact that the, the criticism, in inverted commas, immediately after the budget was that where's that eye-catching policy does at least suggest that, OK, perhaps it could have been a bit more ambitious, but there weren't, there weren't it wasn't anything that you would immediately identify as a pasty tax misstep. Um, no, but there wasn't really much cheer for, for backbenchers either. And I think what's been interesting in Westminster over the last two weeks is there's been a lot of speculation about a May election and the Labour Party certainly been promulgating that. However, that ever, there was nothing in this budget to suggest this is pitch rolling ahead of a, a, a big announcement um, of a May election. Mm. And I think the other thing which is interesting about this is normally a cut in tax, a cut in national insurance, would be quite a big deal. Yep. That would be a talking point. But people have almost priced that in there because we had another cut not that long ago with the autumn statement. And so wasn't that partly to do with the fact they briefed it and they briefed it heavily days beforehand? Yeah. Were, you know, so there was, there was nothing there. I mean, don't get me wrong, this, the NHS spending, changes to child benefit, I think there'll be lots of people who, on reflection, will think those positive. But if you brief out the central plank of your budget, the big measure... Well, of course people aren't going to get excited. The other thing that was interesting about it was the non-DOM stuff. And if I were them, just from a sort of strategic and a tactical point of view, I wouldn't have pre-briefed pre that because actually that could have been quite a big thing to have done on the day because, you know, whatever you think about that policy, and bearing in mind they had slagged off Labour for that policy and then nicked oh, it. Yes. But that would have been quite a moment in the chamber. Mm. You know, that would have been quite a big moment. So it's almost like Jeremy Hunt is very unpolitical about doing these things. You're looking sceptical, Andrew. Yeah, there are no shortcuts to happiness. I mean, people discuss these things as if there are, but there aren't. I thought that was quite a deft, um, the way he deprived labour of this policy, which is supposedly going to provide sort of motherhood and apple pie for oh, Come on, having slagged it off, you know, it's like the <laughs> Labour Party, like, we'd like to report a theft, please. <laughs> <laughs> Except there's no police to report it to because of all the cuts. But, 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 again, but again, on that, I mean, again, a policy, just an extension of it, raises some money, pushes Labour into a bit of a corner by saying, well, you're now going to have to, 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 to tell us again how you're going to fund these, these, these other policies. But, but at the end of the day, if you nick not one but two of the opposition's policies that you've been slagging off publicly over the dispatch box at PMQs, it doesn't, doesn't scream strength to me. No, it, it doesn't scream strength but they're not very strong. <laughs> <laughs> and and as, as a senior Tory... Uh, and, in I... fact, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, <laughs> no, it could, actually. Well, that's I mean... a good strap line. It could have been a lot yes, worse. That's, exactly. a, that's, a, that's a slogan. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. But it's yeah. interesting, having... I had lunch with a very senior Conservative today and they were saying to me that the sort of... The chat now amongst Conservative circles is by how much you think we'll lose. That's the... And I think that bu this budget doesn't do anything to, to sort of change that narrative. Just, just one last point, from, a comment from both of you. I, I lost count of the number of times that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, said with straight face or with a massive smile on his face that this was a tax-cutting party. Now, we all know that by the end of this Parliament, we're going to have the biggest tax burden since 1948 when records began. How does he get away with it? Well, both because Labour don't push him on that, do they? I mean, both parties are avoiding this. That, mm. that we're, you only really cut spending by cutting functions, and no one has identified functions mm. presently paid for by the state, which can be got rid of. Not and I easily, think, anyway. And I think the other thing that we learned from the budget is after the, the great non-DOM theft, Labour's not going to put any details out mm. on the table now because they'll fear it's going to get nicked. So we're going to be in this holding pattern now, probably until the short campaign, which is quite frustrating for the public and for us political watchers as well. It certainly is. Uh, Aisha, Andrew, pause right there. When we come back, we'll have much, much more to discuss, uh, including this, a Biden versus Trump presidential election. It is now nailed on following Super Tuesday. But is it a choice that appeals to American voters?
Clark, welcome back. Now, whether you like to call it the golden oldies election or the battle of the pensioner presidents, it seems all but certain November will see the election of the oldest ever American leader. This week, 77-year-old Donald Trump swept to victory in the Super Tuesday primaries. And now, of course, he is expected to face 81-year-old Joe Biden in the race for the White House. Uh, Andrew and Aisha are still here. Aisha, to you first. D does this matter as much as I'm beginning to believe it probably does, that we could well have someone who is, well, 82 by the time that they are sworn in, 86 at the end of their presidential term, second presidential term? I think it really does matter, and mm. I think you're right to be concerned, and I think a lot of people are deeply concerned um, in America and across the world, because whether you like or loathe America, that is one of the most important jobs in the world. It shapes geopolitics, it, you know, it has an impact on all of us. And I do, you know, I, I'm, I'm no fan of, of Donald Trump. I would like Joe Biden to win, but I also feel really disappointed that this is the choice in front of it. I find it extraordinary that the Democrats in this day and age have not managed to find mm. anybody Well, and also, and also to persuade Joe Biden not to run, go for it, I would have thought. Although I, I spoke to um, a, a White House strategist that had spent a lot of time working, and he said, look, we get asked this question all the time, but the truth is, when we run the numbers on other candidates, there's just no-one that has anywhere near the recognition that Biden has. You, you, you... Biden is a professional. And he's, it was a very professional speech, I think, mm. and quite an energetic speech. Mm -hmm. And it even had, it had this stuff about no American boots on the ground in Gaza, but bringing in the poor. But the no American boots is rather worrying, I think, because there's got to be someone's boots. That... Otherwise, you will have thousands and thousands of starving people mm. storming the... the storming the key. Yeah, I have um, to admit, I, I, I don't really know how that's, that's going to work. There's got to be someone. I mean, it's a very difficult thing, distributing food to people who are starving. But, uh, but certainly, certainly the performance he put on in front of both houses at yes. the State of the Union yeah. was enough, I think, to, 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 to take the sting out of some of the criticism. People were poring over every line for a slip-up. Yes. There, there weren't any, I, I, I kind of thought. No, it was well above par. Um, he, and he, yeah, 36 years in the Senate. He's, he, he, he knows what he's doing, actually, with that audience. Mm. He knows how to talk to, talk to these, these mostly pompous, vacuous people. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have any of those in our parliament. Absolutely, Absolutely none. No, but the uh, House of Commons is a lot livelier than the <laughs> American Senate. But I, I do agree. That, I mean, look, I felt it was, a, it was a really punchy performance. And, you know, the kind of sleepy Joe um, sort of cliche was, yeah. was, was sort of gone last night. But, and also some interesting points he made. Like, I thought the point, the point he made about Roe versus versus Wade and abortion rights were really interesting, saying, mm. look, you know, don't ignore With the women. Supreme Court justices yeah. sat right in front of them as he well. He was saying, you know, America's women will speak up and, and they, they're going to sort of use their voice. Mm. So I thought it was there were some very good points in it, but it doesn't take away from the fact that this is going to be a really tight, tough election. And you mentioned Gaza. The worry for a lot of Democrats is that many um, progressives might not come out to vote for Joe Biden because mm. of the, the, the Gaza thing. So he... It feels like there's... You know, Trump seems to have a lot of sort of, you know, wind behind him and there is a bit of a fragmenting between the progressive vote on the Democrat side. But what, what, what about Donald Trump, though? And, of course, you know, romps to victory in the, in the, in the primaries. Nikki Haley has, has, has stepped away. But, you know, she, she took up a big old chunk of the Republican vote in, in certain places. You know, don't, these are people for whom Donald Trump is anathema. I'm not sure how he gets them on site, if it, if it is at all possible. Strikes me that he probably needs a chunk of them if he's going to be the next president. Yeah, he's locked in his base, but whether he can get the swing, that mm. is a question. On the other hand, he is an incredibly resourceful campaigner and he's very good at making it all about Trump mm. by saying totally outrageous and horrible things. Mm. Mm. Um, I think the other thing which is um, going to be really interesting in this is how Biden's team can sell their record better on the economy. Because actually, if you look at some of the raw numbers, they've actually done not bad on the economy. They've done quite well. And you look at the employment figures, you look at the growth figures, but somehow they're really struggling to communicate that to the American public. And in fact, there is a perception that everybody goes, oh, actually, the economy was really good under Donald Trump. So I think mm -hmm. they have a big air war message that they've got to really sort of push in tough. I, I want to move us on to, to, to an unrelated topic. Now, whilst it's Biden versus Trump in the United States, it could be democracy with a difference in South Devon at the next general election. Campaigners in the town of Totnes are trying to persuade voters and opposition parties to unite behind one candidate to take on the Conservatives at the next election. It's a seat that they have won for the last 
hundred years. And I was having a look at the figures here, Andrew, and going on current polling, 34% of those in the Tottenham South Devon uh, constituency would be voting Conservative. If you take together the votes for the other parties, uh, Liberals, Labour, uh, Green, 59%. So I can sort of see the rationale for them doing it. It's just I feel a little bit uneasy, I have to say. Well, our system forces coalitions within parties if you're going to have a chance of getting a substantial number of seats. Mm. And this, this initiative in Tottenham, I'm, I'm sure it's very well-intentioned, but it's people who can't decide whether they're Green or Lib Dem or Labour. And they, basically, they've got to decide and they've got to go for one party, mm. one progressive party. You can't have three. And this, and this is... But, but all designed because they don't have the share of the vote that would guarantee them under a first-past-the-post system, which, let's not forget, is our system, you know, would not let them win the seat. I can, I can understand why people are really frustrated and why they want to do this. This is a sort of yearning for proportional representation and people mm. saying, right, we're going to do something about it. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. It's not the first time there's been a primary. Actually, the Conservatives had some primaries back in the mm. day. Dr Sarah Wollaston um, was elected under a, a yeah. primary, but that, of course, was a Conservative um, primary. The difficulty with this, and it's going to be in really interesting to see how it pans out, is that the Labour and the Liberal Democrats could still field a candidate, so you could still split that progressive vote. But what it does give us a nod towards is that there is going to be a lot of tactical voting mm -hmm. at the next... We've seen a lot of that in by-elections, yeah, totally. actually, so far. So I think this movement is really interesting and it's tapping into a frustration with First Past the Post and it's tapping into a, a, a movement towards more tactical voting to vote out the Conservative candidate. I, mean, I, I have seen in previous elections, we all have seen, you know, tactical voting websites where you could swap your vote with someone in a constituency where it might have, might have more effect. That, you know, I've seen, you know, parties at local level and an individual basis, maybe not campaigning quite as hard, but formalising it in this fashion, Andrew, even despite yes. the fact that no matter who wins the primary, anyone who's on the, who's on the ballot will, could still stand if they want to. But it's, but it's this uh, formalising of it, and I can't quite put into words why it makes me feel uncomfortable, but it does. Yes, and then you wonder whether someone who you've done a deal with is going to keep their side of the bargain. Yeah. My, my former colleague, the late lamented Simon Hoggart, he had a very, very good story about a husband and wife who disagreed about politics, and they agreed that neither of them would vote, and then they both met at the polling <laughs> station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone's, yeah. someone's buying chocolates and flowers <laughs> after that, well, perhaps, perhaps potentially both of them. But look, yeah. just in terms Can of... Can I make one other point oh, sorry, about sorry. It? The thing about, look, people sort of say, look, we don't like these deals, and I think quite a lot of the public understand we don't like these backroom deals. Mm. But let's remember the last general election, there was a bit of a deal done between the Brexit party and the Tories, because it really helped the Tories with the Brexit party kind of stepping down in, mm. in, in some seats as well. So there are these kind of alliances that sort of happen in an informal way. And I think it is just going to be interesting to see, A, how many people participate in this, mm. and does this tap into something that might want to be replicated in other seats? But, but, but briefly, do we think that there will be a move from first past the post at any point in the, in, in the immediate future? Well, it could have happened 100 years ago, but on the whole, it's a loser's policy. I mean, Farage is very keen on representation as well. But, yeah, exactly. um, the one time that I, I hope I and... hope not. I think first past the post concentrates people's minds. Mm. Uh, are you sure? I understand the frustration that people have with first past the the post, and I, I I think I understand a lot of people feeling that they like have a wasted vote. But in to your question, I just can't see. Like, let's say Keir Starmer wins with a thumping majority. He's mm. not going to say in his first 100 days, I'll tell you what, no. I'll just sort of change <laughs> the system to give myself a huge disadvantage. Yeah. That's the problem with yeah. the, you know, changing it. It certainly is, it certainly is. Uh, Aisha, Andrew, thank you very much. We will have much, much more th uh, from you in the 8 o'clock hour, of course, and we'll continue to discuss the day's news. Good week, bad week as well. But coming up in the sport, it is a big weekend across Sky Sports, most of it, in fact, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a big fight tonight. We'll be previewing Anthony Joshua against Francis Ngannou in Riyadh. That's next. I think 
that when we're looking across history, that empires are a fundamental part of our history. Uh, they were the fundamental part of world order. And if we're thinking about this within the wider context, you know, King George III himself in the 1750s argued for uh, the abolition of slavery. He argued that it was immoral. We know that Queen Victoria, for example, was incredibly uh, kind to the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. And so ultimately, when we're looking throughout history, it's very difficult to actually make these specific arguments for who should be paying reparations. I'm half Moroccan. Should the Moroccan kingdom uh, be paying reparations to Cornish people for, for the Barbary slave trade? It's very difficult to actually pin down where these arguments should be lying and actually where this, these reparations or these apologies should, should be kept. King Charles, this is the man who is obviously head of state, head of the Church of England, and ultimately decided to commission the first monarch to commission a report into the royal family's links into the slave trade. So this is a man who was very much centred around equality, right? So this is a good thing. Um, in terms of who should pay it, that's ultimately your point. Well, it starts with King Charles, let's just be clear. Um, the monarchy advocated and benefited from the slave trade. We're talking 3.4 million people that were transported from the African continent into the Americas and the Caribbean, 450,000 of which died during the process. Monarchy advocated and benefited from that. We also have the fact that the slave owners were compensated, so people like you, people like me, paid as taxpayers for the slave owners uh, a declaration or agreement that was sorted out 400 years ago in the past. King Charles is not personally responsible. Nobody today is personally responsible for the slave trade. And, and, I, and I hear your point, and I hear the fact that, you know, racism still exists today. And, and me, many, many of the institutional difficulties that we see today stem from these historical grievances. Yes, thank you. However, thank you. However, nobody today caused the slave trade. Yeah. Nobody alive today yeah. financially benefits from the slave trade today. And so I think it's incredibly, I, I think, uh, misingenuous to actually look at these arguments and actually say that we can trace back exactly who benefited, where benefited. But we can. Where, no, we cannot. We can. uh, welcome back to Friday Night, where we are turning our attention to tonight's heavyweight clash between Anthony Joshua and the former UFC heavyweight champion, Francis Ngannou. Terry, back from Sky Sports News once again. Good to Evening. see you. I'm getting quite excited about this one because <laughs> Anthony Joshua, I think by, by common consent, needs to, needs to do well in this. Plenty of people calling for a knockout. But Francis Ngannou, he is a monster. It's almost nothing to win, is there, for Anthony Joshua in the sense he's an Olympic boxing mm. champion of that London 2012, two-time world champion, looking to climb the mountain for a third time, get back, really, from where he lost back-to-back -back fights to Alexander Usyk. They're saying in Saudi Arabia that he will get the shot at the winner of the Tyson Fury-Usyk match in May, which one Joshua would want, I'm not sure. But then you're up against a guy who's six foot four inches tall, 19 and a half stone, put Tyson Fury on his backside a few months ago, which uh, few people outside Deontay Wilder have done. And he is a novice, so there's not going to be much kudos for Anthony Joshua if he wins, but the jeopardy if he loses against a very heavy-handed man who's had his punches measured as some of the hardest in the world. He is a, a mixed martial arts champion, but as Joshua has pointed out, had a background in boxing and just looked very composed against yeah. Tyson Fury. Went the distance, kept his hands up, the foot movement was good for a guy that's been doing wrestling and jiu-jitsu and everything totally. for the past few years. He, he looks very accomplished. So it's, it's a dangerous one for Joshua. He's got a lot at stake in terms of his career in belts. Obviously, he's a very successful man, very affluent man, but this is a, a significant one if he does want to be champion again. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? If he wants the world title fight, he has to win tonight and he has to win well. Doesn't yes. he? I think it's because, to be fair to Ngannou, I mean, I watched the Tyson Fury fight. I mean, that, that frankly could have gone the other way. Yes. I think. Well, it's, it's interesting to hear Tyson Fury talk about this, and he said that he was off there. A lot of people said he was off the couch for that fight, wasn't conditioned, <laughs> which you look back at the pictures and possibly was. But I think maybe that is the, the, the road for Joshua. He's trying to prove himself after a loss against Andy Ruiz that he did avenge, and then two against Alexander Usyk that he, he d d d belongs in the company with Tyson Fury. And I suppose the easiest way to do that is to do better against Ngannou than Tyson Fury did. They say the argument is that his principles, he's a more orthodox boxer than Tyson Fury. Perhaps if he sticks to that, 
that will come out against Francis Ngannou. But a lot riding on it. And as you say, I think that that is for, for Anthony Joshua. He has to perform well and he has to, to impress because there are other guys. There's, there's Zile Zag against Joseph Parker on the undercard. And it's all underway now, by the way, mm. on Sky Sports Box Office, which is a significant heavyweight fight. Both of those men will be bidding for a shot at the winner of Usyk Fury as well. We've got 45 seconds left, Teddy. Um, we're back in Saudi Arabia. We yeah. are back in Riyadh. Bob yeah. Arum, uh, if, if, uh, Tyson Fury's promoter, said this. You know, we don't pay the bills. The kingdom of South, uh, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, um, pays the bills. I mean, if, if, if the Saudis want the fight there... It's going to be there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Amnesty International will, 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 and all the human rights campaigners will, of course, say this is sports washing, but then they'll look at the Saudi Pro League. All the footballers have, have gone there. The tennis involvement now, golf. Mm. It's, a, it's an investment across the sporting landscape, but particularly in boxing, because you need to put up purses for individual fights to get the big names there. Mm. And interesting that Tyson Fury wasn't talking about the WBC one or the other governing bodies like the WBA. He said if Turkey Al Sheikh, who is head of the General Entertainment Authority in Saudi Arabia, says that the winner of Joshua against Ngannou gets the winner of Fury Usyk, then it's likely to happen, which is a strange turn of events in a, in a very complex sport. They seem to have uh, made it a lot more simple with, with the cash, all the promoters working together, all the big fighters coming together. Uh, so where can we watch it? You can watch it on uh, Sky Sports Box Office right now. Ring walks for the main event expected 11 o'clock tonight, and that's skysports.com slash box office. Plenty more sport, though, Teddy. Take us through it. Yep, absolutely. Busy uh, day, to, busy evening. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Now this signifies a corner, okay? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually a uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to ac actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Allison, Rebecca Welsh and Sunny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing with new refs coming through, having people to aspire to. The organisation BAM Ref was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, Sorry, I've guys. never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage, uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Teddy, thank you. Uh, time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. And I'm afraid it's going to be turning more unsettled and showery this weekend. And a brisk easterly wind is going to make it feel pretty chilly too. For most places, a breezy but dry evening with thicker cloud bringing some patchy rain or drizzle towards the northeast and outbreaks of showery rain in the far southwest. 
Outbreaks of rain in the Channel Islands, Cornwall and southwestern Ireland will spread northeast overnight into much of England and Wales, with mostly cloudy skies elsewhere and a moderate to fresh easterly wind. The showers continuing to spread northwards across the UK and Ireland through Saturday, accompanied by brisk easterly winds. It will be chilly and cloudy for most, although some brighter spells are likely for southeast England and northwest Scotland. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the second hour of Friday night, an investigation concludes the activities of a British mole at the very top of the IRA probably led to more lives being lost than saved. Welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in the second hour of the show, our news reviewers are back to help with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week, plus plenty more from the team in Tinseltown ahead of the Oscars. But first, the headlines this hour. More lives lost than saved. The findings of a damning report into Steak Knife, the British agent acting as a spy inside the provisional IRA. Reports of deaths on the ground after parachutes failed to open on a Gazan airdrop. The Education Secretary comes out swinging as Gillian Keegan says she'd be happy to punch an Ofsted inspector. Also tonight, there will be no May by December as the former Prime Minister confirms she is standing down as an MP at the next election. Hello from Hollywood, where we'll be joined by a British filmmaker who's hoping to win her first Oscar at Sunday's Academy Awards. Plenty more to come from Katie at Universal Studios and plenty more as well from our all-star panel. Andrew Jimson and Aisha Hazarika, who have the unenviable task of helping me pick this week's winners and losers. Andrew, well, he'll be trying to persuade us that despite their worst ever poll rating and a budget that even a mother couldn't love, it was somehow a good week for the Prime Minister. And it was definitely a bad week for the German Air Force after being hacked by the Russians. President Putin rubbing it in 
with a photo op in a flight simulator. Uh, plus, just a little later in the sport, a pivotal weekend in the Premier League's title race. Liverpool will be wanking Man City to Anfield. Will it all be hugs and kisses when Jurgen and Pep meet on the touchline? Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight, it's Friday night. Evening all. A seven-year investigation into a British mole inside the IRA has concluded that his actions probably resulted in more lives being lost than saved. Freddy Scapatici, who was codenamed Steak Knife, headed an IRA unit whose job was to find and kill informants. But an investigation found strong evidence of very serious criminality by him and criticised the security forces for failing to protect those at risk. Our senior island correspondent David Blevins reports from Belfast. This is Freddy Scapatici, an IRA enforcer turned British spy, the golden goose of agents, according to one defence chief. But a seven-year investigation found that more lives were lost than saved by the mole they codenamed Steak Knife, a damning indictment of intelligence gathering. It put lives at risk. It left those on the front line exposed and let down. And it fostered a maverick culture for some where agent handling was sometimes seen as high stakes, dark art, and was practiced off the books. The report calls on the UK government and the Republican movement to apologize, the onus falling on the first minister. I am sorry for all the lives lost during the conflict without exception. Regrettably, the past cannot be changed or can, cannot be undone. Neither can the suffering, the hurt, or the political balance of conflict be disowned by Republicans or indeed by any other party to the conflict. Scabatici ran the IRA's so-called nutting squad, rooting out alleged informants for torture and murder. Unmasked in 2003, he denied the claims. I'm telling you I'm not guilty of any of these allegations. But couldn't escape the headlines in Belfast and entered witness protection in England, where he died last year. Freddy Scavatici exemplified the dirty war between the IRA and British intelligence, a murky world of espionage where some turned a blind eye to murder, dark secrets that Steak Knife has taken to his grave. Sandra Peake, who works with bereaved families, says they live with the shame of having their loved ones labelled traitors. I mean, I've often said, David, that when your loved one is killed at the hands of the, of the other community, support is often there. But when your loved one's killed at the hands of people within your own community and with a label, it becomes a stigmatised death. And that's something which is very difficult for families to deal with. A lawyer for relatives says it's clear the state and IRA conspired together to murder. Today's report presents as a damning indictment on the state. The staggering takeaway message is that the state could have and should have intervened to save lives. That this didn't happen is legally and morally reprehensible. And the 200 pages leave one question unanswered. How much has changed in terms of how British intelligence operates now? David Blevins, Sky News in Belfast. Up to five people are reported to have died after an airdrop of aid over Gaza went wrong. Reports say parachutes failed to open, leaving the cargo to crash into waiting crowds. The incident happened on the same day the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, confirmed the UK will be involved in an American-led operation to build a temporary port in Gaza and open a sea corridor from Cyprus. Well, the World Food Programme says hunger has reached catastrophic levels in the north of Gaza, where children are dying of hunger-related diseases. The old and the young are the most affected, with one in six children under the age of two suffering from acute malnutrition. Currently, around 150 trucks are entering the strip each day, but the WFP says a minimum of 300 are needed to meet people's most basic needs. At the moment, aid can only be brought in through two crossings in the south of Gaza, Rafa and Kerem Shalom, with small amounts of aid being dropped by plane. The new plan will see the Cypriot port of Larnaca become a logistics hub for aid from around the world, with a temporary port built by the Americans in Gaza, likely near the current one in the north of the Strip. Sky's Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle has the latest. A week ago, 
Ten-year-old Yazan al Kafana was being comforted by his mother at a hospital in Rafa. His face is gaunt, his eyes and cheeks sunken in hunger. He's almost too weak to cry out, but the pain is clear on his face. Three days later, Yazan died, another victim of malnutrition in Gaza. I lost my son due to malnutrition, due to the circumstances we're going through in Gaza. What are you expecting from a sick child living in such conditions? How can he get better? America's plan to bring aid into Gaza by sea is another sign of growing frustration with its ally, Israel, and the prospect of widespread famine. One option could be something like this, a floating pontoon stretching some distance offshore into deeper waters and away from the threat of fighting on land. This is from a US exercise a few years ago, but experts say that it will take weeks to get it up and running. It is a medium-term solution to an immediate crisis. I think it will take at least an, a couple of weeks, um, perhaps even uh, four weeks, six weeks, um, it's, it's not that easy to get these, um, I think it will be mostly floating devices with anchors that you want to put there in front of, uh, of the coast. The aid will need to be received in a secure zone and it will need organisations to distribute it to avoid scenes like these. Britain has now announced its involvement. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was in Cyprus today to inspect the port at Larnaca and said that a ship would sail to Gaza imminently. Food was being loaded up with the aim to land up to 200 pallets a day on Gaza's beaches. Despite all the challenges, and this is truly inspiring, we are now very close to the opening of the corridor, hopefully this Saturday, this Sunday. And I'm very glad to see that an initial pilot operation will be launched today. Aid drops continued over Gaza today, but it is inefficient and risky. Multiple people were reportedly killed in the north when a parachute malfunctioned, turning desperately needed aid into a dangerous projectile. Land crossings are by far and away the best way to get aid into Gaza in the quantities needed. But the international community says Israel must still do more. The chances of premature babies surviving in Gaza now is slim. They are kept alive in the few incubators still working, but their mothers are often unable to feed them, to malnourish themselves. Outside this small, rare bubble of hope, everyone else is fighting for survival. The weakest and smallest, as always, are the most vulnerable. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News. A government adviser has warned that London streets have become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian -Pro protests. The counter-extremism commissioner, Robin Simcox, spoke out ahead of another mass rally planned for the capital tomorrow. Well, his comments come after a pro-Palestinian campaigner slashed a painting on display at Cambridge University. Our home editor, Jason Farrell, has this report. A Jewish bakery in North London. They didn't want us to name it, fearful of anti-Semitism. Some customers here, too, say they wouldn't travel into central London on the day of a pro-Palestinian protest. I would not go to London or stay, stay, go in any area that there are pro-Palestinian uh, protesters. I would tell people to avoid central London if they looked all sounded Jewish. Yes, definitely. On the high street in Golders Green, we came across Israel's national police spokesman, Mickey Rosenfeld, in the UK to talk to officials here about Jewish security in Europe. The threats have increased, but not just here in England and in London. The threats have increased uh, all across uh, Paris, mm. as well as in uh, Germany and other areas uh, such as uh, Brussels, where there is an increase of uh, pro-Palestinian uh, protests which are taking place, and that is something which should be worrying both to the local governments and communities as well as security forces. 
Another large pro-Palestinian protest will flow through London streets on Saturday. And the extremist czar, Robin Simcox, says this is turning central London into a no-go zone for Jewish people. But Hackney MP Diane Abbott posted on X, time to nail these lies about Jews being frightened to come into London on pro-Palestinian march days, adding pictures showing Jewish people on the marches. Ahead of the Saturday demonstration, feminist groups were raising their voices for the women of Gaza to mark International Women's Day. The people on the street are there because human beings are being slaughtered and murdered, starved to death. Uh, no aid is allowed in, no agreement on a ceasefire. The UK government is uh, giving Israel arms and weapons. So instead of, like, they're trying to shift focus on what they're doing and what they failed to do and then link it up to a specific religion. A group called Palestine Action shared a video on social media of a demonstrator vandalising a painting of Lord Balfour at Cambridge's Trinity College. As Foreign Secretary, he'd signed the Balfour Declaration in 1917, favouring the establishment in Palestine of a national home for Jewish people. Some groups involved in all kinds of protests will be waiting in anticipation for a move by the government next week to change the definition of extremism, which could include anyone promoting an ideology that undermines British values. It's absurd, the comments that are coming out of the Conservative Party with Rishi Sunak standing there trying to undermine the democratic process, the democratic right of people to protest against a genocide. It's not yet clear who the new definition will affect or the impact it will have, but it's likely to be another factor in this debate for weeks to come. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Let's take a quick look at some of the day's other top stories. And the Metropolitan Police officer charged with murdering 24-year-old Chris Cabot in South London has been publicly named. 40-year-old Martin Blake shot Mr Cabot through a car windscreen in Streatham in September of 2022. He has pleaded not guilty. Mr Cabot's family made a statement outside the Old Bailey. Police cannot and should not be above the law. Accountability for police officers and forces involved in death, even where evidence of criminality and wrongdoing is identified, is extremely rare. In any other murder trial, the accused would be publicly named. This case should be no different. We welcome today's decision to name the officer. Inquest and the family are not able to comment any further at this stage. Thank you. Well, the Police Federation, which represents officers, released this statement. The Metropolitan Police Federation and the colleagues we represent are hugely shocked, saddened and concerned over the decision to name the firearms officer involved in this incident. Being a firearms officer in London is one of the world's toughest jobs. Officers who volunteer for the role know the responsibility and accountability that comes with it. A woman accused of killing her newborn baby says she feels responsible for the death of her baby daughter. Constance Martin told a jury that she and Mark Gordon bought duvets and hats to keep warm while living in a tent on the run. They deny manslaughter. Police have sealed off three funeral homes in Humberside after complaints about the mistreatment of bodies. Officers say they're investigating a firm called Legacy Independent Funeral Directors and have set up a phone line for relatives. Theresa May has announced that she'll be standing down at the general election. She was, of course, Britain's second female prime minister and has been in Parliament for 27 years. Rishi Sunak has described her as a fiercely loyal MP and is defining what it means to be a public servant. The Education Secretary has said she would have liked to punch a group of Ofsted inspectors. Speaking at an education conference, Gillian Keegan said she'd been told by one school just how rude inspectors could be. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say, I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said, they told me how the Ofsted, you know, their Ofsted experience had gone. And I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. I mean, you expect people to be rude to you when you're a politician. You kind of sign up for that. But, you know, when you're kind of trying to run a school and educate children and change lives, you don't expect somebody to come in and not be respectful. Uh, let's bring in our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, who is in Westminster. Evening, Tamara. And, and, and interesting, 
intervention by the education sector, particularly given that any teacher knows, and presumably the education sector knows as well, that if you hit an Ofsted inspector, you'd be struck off and you'd never teach again. Absolutely. I mean, Gillian Keegan is known as a plain speaking politician. She's been in trouble for that before. But her comments to a room full of head teachers caused quite a lot of surprise and, in fact, outrage. This is the sort of reaction uh, that we've had since she made them earlier this morning. The head of the FDA union, which represents senior civil servants, called them completely unacceptable and said, imagine the outcry if a civil servant had said they wanted to punch a minister who was being disrespectful. We've also heard uh, from Mike Short from the Unison Trade Union uh, saying there's clearly a lot that can and should be improved about Ofsted, but making light of violence in schools when staff are increasingly likely to face assault for doing their jobs, he said, was in very poor taste. She's also been criticised by her Labour opposition, uh, who said that she should be uh, improving Ofsted, not punching working people. Now, a source close to Gillian Keegan said that it was a light-hearted remark and taken as such at this conference and that clearly she had not, in, she would never intend to punch anyone, um, but that she was making a point about how good teachers and head teachers uh, are sometimes held back. This was all, of course, in the context of the big reforms that Ofsted, the school's watchdog, have admitted they need to do following the tragic suicide of the head teacher, Ruth Perry. Now, the new boss of Ofsted, Martin Oliver, was actually at this conference, watched Gillian Keegan's remarks and gave a speech uh, there himself. Uh, so there was quite a lot of surprised uh, reaction to what she said, but so far, uh, those close to her saying that it was taken as light hearted. Mm. Let's see what happens next. Tamara, for now, thanks very much. Uh, well, let's bring in our news reviewers on this topic. Biographer of Boris Johnson, contributor to Conservative Home, Andrew Jimson, and Aisha Hazarika, broadcaster and former Labour advisor. Good to see you both again. Um, sources close to Gillian Keegan, uh, Andrew, telling us that this was meant to be taken in a light-hearted fashion. Uh, sources close to Neil Patterson say, what on earth is she talking about? Well, it's, it sounds as though she's expressing, in a rather exaggerated, Liverpudlian way, sympathy with the teachers in this school who felt mm. that they had a rough that the offset inspector had been very rude to them. But it is, it is poor behaviour. I mean, she, she should be put in detention, I think. I, I think at, at, at a minimum, Aisha. It's a bit sort of brass eye, isn't it, this sort of headline? And also, I, can't, I think, I feel like uh, Gillian Keegan is sort of lining herself up to be a bit of a John Prescott type figure. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? In that kind of, like, I could almost... What, sort punching of, voter? Yes. Well, I could almost sort of imagine, like, that's the sort of... But I, I, I kind of... Not all of us share that view you know, of the education secretary. No egg. no egg in. No, I mean, I do... I think, look, I think she's expressing a frustration that a lot of people have with, with Offset. Mm -hmm. I think she just... I think she uses very colourful language and I think she quite likes it. Are we, are we perhaps sometimes, Andrew, just a little bit poor face when, when, when politicians are trying to be real people? I mean, she was speaking to, you know, she was speaking to educators, she was speaking to people who've been on the receiving end of Ofsted inspections. And, you know, any, anyone who's, who knows any teacher knows just how, how, how horrible those, the, the, those inspections can be. But well, it's, it's true that in our trade we leap at two or three words and make a big story out of it. Yes. And, pre and pretend to a degree of indignation that is mm. completely bogus. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But I, I, which, which, which is kind of my point, but at the same time, is it ever advisable for an elected representative, not in fact more than that, you know, a senior cabinet minister, to be saying things like, do you know what, I'd, I'd have punched them if I were in your shoes? I mean, it's really daft. It's a really daft thing to say, given that... We're not supportive of antisocial behaviour in schools. We're not supportive. Actually, you know, there is an issue with, like, mm. there was a report out last week saying that actually a lot of teachers feel quite threatened at school and things like that. So it's not a sensible thing to do. But I, I think I sort of slightly do agree with Andrew. I think sometimes we can slightly clutch our pearls for dramatic effect to, keep, mm. to get a story going, to get a, a line going. But I do... But I think partly um, she has slight end of term feeling because she's like, ah, you know, yes. I don't know how much longer we're all going to be here for. Just mm. let it all out. Yeah. 
Andrew, you, you, you want kind of fan, like to fantasy Eckler stuff? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's surprising, actually, that discipline has been maintained to the extent that it has, actually. Mm -hmm. The Tories haven't fallen completely to bits. Well, quite a lot of them are trudging off from the battlefield mm -hmm. and announcing there is treason they did today. But, um... but, but just, on, just on Aisha's point, the idea that perhaps everyone's getting just a little bit demob happy. I mean, you said, you said yeah. last hour we were, we were discussing, you know, kind of expectations, and the expectation is the Conservatives will not be the government to the other side of the election. If the public is thinking that, then presumably people like the Education Secretary are probably thinking it as well. They probably are, and it's so tiresome just being con constantly... A, a, uh, being a sort of a goody goody, biting your tongue, never, never playing your natural game. Um, it, it, it's a dreadful way to spend one's life, actually. 100%. Being on message and no one pays the blindest bit of attention to you. <laughs> well, absolutely. From one year to the next, if you, if you, if you, if you do things that way. I suspect as well, Gillian Keegan, in her afterlife, will have quite a big career as a broadcaster or a podcaster. I think I, I think you may have a point, but you know you can't. You're, you're still not allowed to punch people if you're a podcast. <laughs> That's as well. so true. And believe me, believe me, I've wanted to on many an occasion. <laughs> no um, classical case. Well, exactly. Anyway, let's move on because, of course, there's a big event happening across the Atlantic. Uh, stars, writers, directors, and their entourages, massive, uh, are heading for Hollywood for this weekend's Oscars. Several nominees could be making history if they win a statue on Sunday night. Uh, we did have the traditional office punch-up over who was covering this particular story. And, of course, Sky's art and entertainment correspondent, Katie Spencer, took a few tips from Gillian Keegan and ended up at Universal Studios tonight. Katie, what are you looking forward to now? You just couldn't squeeze into that glittery dress, could you, Neil, this year? Um, Not no, yeah, we're still here at the Universal Studios. <laughs> Not anymore, no. Um, yeah, we're here at Universal Studios talking about the, the big films that are nominated at this year's Academy Awards this Sunday. Um, look, it, it is films like Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things. They're the ones that are getting a lot of attention, but... What's also, also worth noting about the brilliance of the Academy Awards is what it can do for newer filmmakers whose names aren't perhaps out there. And we're joined, uh, we're going to be joined very shortly uh, by a British filmmaker who is up for her first Oscar. She's nominated for Best Short for a film called Red, White and Blue, which is all about um, a woman who has to cross state lines uh, in search of an abortion. Let's take a quick look. I need an abortion, like, yesterday. Do you have an appointment? Um... I tried calling, but I, can, I couldn't get through. I, I've come all the way from Arkansas. Yeah, you and everybody from that state, and all the other ones, too. Please. I'm desperate. I don't have time. I, I really need to get back to my son. All I can do is take your name, honey, and put you on the waiting list. But I gotta warn you, it's pretty long. Nasrin Chowdhury is the writer and director behind that film. Nasrin, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, firstly, look, we'll get on to the, to the subject matter of the film in a minute, but what a huge honour to be in the running for this. It's your first Oscar nomination. How did you hear about the fact that you were nominated? How does it feel? We knew we were in contention. We got on a Zoom with our cast and crew very early in the morning because I now live in Los Angeles and have done for the past decade or so. And we found out in real time together and it was just extraordinary. We couldn't quite believe it, but I think we're starting to slowly believe it with only 48 hours or so to go. Uh, what, a, what a terrific achievement. Um, to give us an idea of your background, you moved over here 12 years ago, but you were working on some, some British sort of institutions, EastEnders, things like yes, that. Yes, I worked on so many uh, TV shows. I started out in film, actually, and then transitioned into TV, worked for every long-running series you can name, whether it was a storyline writer of, uh, on Coronation Street or EastEnders, Casualty, and so on. And then 12 years ago, I made the move over to the States because of the showrunner model that you have, you know, with writers' rooms and working on exciting shows out here like Jack Ryan and Fear the Walking Dead and so many other shows. And then I decided to direct my first uh, short film in the aftermath of uh, the Supreme Court's decision to reverse Roe v. Wade in 2022. Look, what a, what a serious subject matter to attempt to, to tackle. For you, is it just, uh, was it the, the motivation behind it was so important because it is just a fundamental changing of women's rights in this country? Yeah, and look, I'm a woman. I'm raising two young daughters in America and the fact that our reproductive rights and our access to health care was reversed we needed to tell a story about the human cost of that and understanding that the humanity that we need to bring, that's a conversation that transcends politics, even though it has become very political. So how could we best do that as storytellers and filmmakers? It was to just tell the story that we told in Red, White and Blue. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you're a Brit, you have a British background, though, but does it, it, it feel sort of like this is an issue that is of such a sort of global importance? That... Absolutely, and also, you can hear my accent. I always joke that you can take the girl out of London, but you can't take London out of the girl, but I am an American citizen now, yeah. as well as a UK citizen, and people want to think that this is just an American problem. It really is a global issue of bodily autonomy. There never seems to be a time when we don't have to fight for that. And I think there's this um, thought that I have anyway, uh, in and of myself, that maybe others are thinking too, which is if it can happen here in America, where you think you're protected in this land with the free and the greatest democracy in the world, as many Americans aspire for this country to be, then it can happen anywhere. We should never take it for granted. Just very quickly, because we're running out of time, how has this whole experience been for you? It must be incredibly surreal looking around and seeing all these famous faces at the Oscars lunch. And oh, I mean, like talking to Steven Spielberg, and he's like they're writing my name down and saying, I'm going to watch your short film. Two days ago, I was at dinner with Greta Gerwig, who was telling me, oh, my parents loved your film. They might want to come and say hello to you. Yeah. I mean, it's surreal, but it's wonderful. And the fact that I can take my two young daughters to the Oscars with me, it's going to be magical. And uh, Hopefully it also shines a light on the story that we tried to tell. What an experience. Best of luck with the weekend. We'll be looking out for you on the red carpet. Thank Good you. Luck. Red, white and blue, yeah. UK and US. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for talking to us. Back to you, Neil, then. We'll have to be rooting for Nazarene on Sunday. We certainly will. Katie, thanks very much. And, of course, much, much more from Katie uh, throughout the evening. Uh, do stick with us. Coming up next, we will be continuing our review of the week's news with the help of, Aisha, uh, of Andrew Timson and Aisha Hazarika. Um, starting with this, why it has been a good week for one of the band members of Blur, hoping to become an MP. But by way of contrast, a pretty bad week for the German Air Force, who just happened to give away by accident some of Ukraine's secrets. That's that. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson, continuing our review of the week's news. And it is at this point we ask, who's had a good week and who's had a bad one? The weekend is here. So who's relieved it's all over and who has finished a winner? Uh, still with us, Andrew and Aisha. Um, and, Andrew, we're going to start with you. You think 
that it has been a good week for Rishi Sunak. I was a, I was a little bit cheeky in the introduction to this hour, um, so you're going to have to explain. I think every week is good for Rishi Sunak, and we'll look back on him as a Prime Minister of, of, of great distinction. Uh, Keir Starmer completely fails to... to, to to get the better of him at Prime Minister's questions. And when one considers how unpopular the Tories are, and they fell at the beginning of this Dear week Lord, to yeah. a record low of 20% in one poll, and, and Labour on about 47 or something, mm. uh, uh, I think it's the way he... And his ability to, to hold um, information in his head and to reproduce it as required, it's very, very impressive. And whoever succeeds him may not be quite as, as good as he is. And then we'll look back and say, oh, couldn't wish we had such a reputable person and such a, a brilliant person, actually. He's, he's quite And good. everyone, because he's going to lose, mm -hmm. everyone is rather... or there's a tendency to be rather scornful about him. Well, sometimes one does lose, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're, you're either bad or incompetent. Aisha, do you agree 100% with what Andrew just said? <laughs> <laughs> Only 99%. <laughs> <laughs> I think Andrew's done a very admirable effort there. Um, actually, a better effort than quite a lot of front bench sort of. Do you think I could get in the House of Lords yeah, by, I if so. I carry on in this? So. Yeah, <laughs> that's my, that, that, that's my agenda, you know. Yes. Baron Jimson. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I think that Rishi Sunak, um, I'll be honest, with you, I don't think he is quite suited to being Prime Minister. I think he's ah, very smart. Yes. I think he's hard working. Is he I any like good at the fact is that he, any good he at goes and makes the bed yeah. in the middle of the day um, for his wife. I think that's a very good quality. I, I think you're right. I think he's quite unpolitical. Mm. And I think that is his biggest problem. I don't I he look he's not like his either his predecessors, Liz Truss or Boris. He did Johnson. steady the ship after after the Truss. Um, episode. True, didn't but you? that's not. Which that. quite I, I think, I, think I could have probably I done that. No, you right couldn't. I, I don't think you no, could. No, I, think the, I think the lettuce. <laughs> could I think it's have more, done difficult, a job more difficult of, than like, it looks. But actually. I, true, I, true. I think. Look, I, I don't think he's a, you know an indecent man. I think he's hardworking, but I, I feel like he sort of doesn't have that kind of connection with with sort of granular politics. No. What about your choice for for good week, Aisha? Um, the blur drummer Dave Rowntree now. A Labour parliamentary candidate. So, full disclosure, I know uh, Dave, mm. and he's a very talented person. He's an extraordinary talented musician mm. with a very successful bandler. But he's also a really political animal. He stood a, to be a Labour councillor, he served as a Labour councillor, and he's tried to be selected a few times. And I think it's actually really great that somebody like him, who, let's be honest, can have a very nice life mm -hmm. touring and, you know, makes plenty of money, he's actually decided that he wants to serve. I think his, his like, campaign slogan should be, there's no other way. That's quite good. Oh. Yes, it's a, it's a blur song, if you didn't know what they were talking about there. Um, but, but, but why is it, though, that he is not in a safe seat, that he's not in a, or, or, or kind of a less marginal seat than the one he's been signed up for? It, it strikes me, we've seen it, I thought, we also saw it with, with, with Eddie Azard as well, that the party doesn't seem to like putting these kind of high-profile candidates into... Well, I think... Uh, uh, and, they, and they don't. I mean, I think, basically, just because you're a celebrity, it doesn't give you a God-given right to get a safe seat. And I think the Labour Party is very kind of mindful of the fact that everybody, whether you're a, you know, a prince or a pauper, you know, you have to, you know, take your chances. And remember, there is a myth that the party can stitch things up. They can sometimes, but a lot oh, of the well, times... they stitched it up a no, great deal. It is a lot and of also it they is might done... be worried that he's so rich he's going to be independent. No, I think they, they also... just want They just want, they they... just want sort of people who toe the party line. I think they, they also... It, a lot of it is down to party members. Look, for example, look at Rochdale, mm. right? True. There was a candidate called Paul Wall who was a very oh, yeah. well-respected... Um, chief political commentator at the I yes. newspaper. A lot of the Westminster watchers were like, oh, the party will fix it for him to win. No, mm, no. the local members wanted somebody different. I do want to move us on, because this my, our suggestion uh, for, for Good Week uh, is the 18-year-old Oliver Behrman. I would suggest perhaps the most excited 18-year-old in the world right now, the British teenager, was told at lunchtime that he is going to be driving for Ferrari in this weekend's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix uh, after one of their two drivers, the main drivers, developed a Decitis. He's going to be starting tomorrow's race from 11th as the youngest ever British driver in Formula One. Look, I'm not an F1 expert, but can we just have a moment to reflect on what's going to be a great weekend for this young man? It's fantastic. Yeah, if you can do this stuff, you can usually do it young, can't you? Yeah. But it's great that he's got a chance to show, show it. Mm. I mean, I mean just... what an amazing life he's going to have. What an incredible experience. What a life. What adventures. I mean, extraordinary. Yeah, just hope he doesn't get Lewis Hamilton's haircut at the end of it all, you know. <laughs> um, let's go on to choices for bad weeks, however. And, Aisha, um, you, you think it's been a bad week for Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, and 
the topic of fat shaming. What was that? Well, I thought it was more of a bad week for Keir Starmer because Peter Mandelson was a bit mean about Keir Starmer. Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, sort of fat shamed uh, Keir Starmer on his podcast on Times Radio and said that he'd sort of put on a bit of weight and he was talking about how important it is about the appearance of a leader during an election and that actually when he worked for Neil Kinnock, you know, he tried to sort of get Neil Kinnock to change his ties and then he did make a bit of a rude comment which then Jeremy Hunt mm. um, re-echoed at uh, the budget. So I feel a bit sore, I feel like a bit sad for, for, for Keir Starmer. The Chancellor mean. would not have done it had it been a female politician opposite him. Discuss. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That's true. That is true, actually. The, 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 it's, it's, it's very, it's, yeah, the, peop the people in charge do tend to be quite thin, don't they? I mean, actually, the <laughs> Prime Minister is very thin. <laughs> yeah. Also, Jeremy Hunt rubbed salt in and the wound because was, he when, went in a massive When did we run? last have a tub? I suppose Callaghan was quite a tubby Boris Prime Johnson. Boris was tubby, yes, that's mm. true. He was... A bit of a salad yeah. dodger. Good point, yes. Yeah, so and you got... <laughs> hey, hey, before, after he had that fright... Before, before, before we died. land Friday night yeah. with Neil yeah. Patterson in the middle of a fat-shaming <laughs> scandal, let's move ourselves <laughs> on, Andrew, yes. to yes. your choice for bad week. You think it has been a bad week for the Luftwaffe, the Terrible. German Air Force. I mean, that Gore. chap who rang in from Singapore and the Russians... I mean, the Russians, of course, completely penetrated Germany many years ago, and they've got the former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder on the board of the gas pipeline thing. Um, and he, so he's completely in their pocket. So, so um, what, what, and, and actually, this, this is quite, this, this is actually. I mean, it's 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 funny, but it's also serious because Putin was a KGB man in East Germany, mm -hmm. and sent for the tanks to defend the KGB headquarters. And the tanks said, "Well, we'll have to wait for a call from Moscow." And the call from Moscow never came. Mm -hmm. Putin speaks German, uh, and he really wants to divide the Western alliance. But was, was this something as simple as someone who should know better using an unsecured phone line? I mean, it's not exactly hacking of the highest level. No, but the German... Um, the, well, the German armed services are in a very poor state and the German secret services are almost limitlessly incompetent, actually. Yeah, I think you may have a point there. Um, final, our final topic. Um, I would like to suggest that it has been a bad week for writing late-night letters. It has now been revealed it cost taxpayers £15,000 to cover the damages after uh, the science secretary, Michelle Donnellan, falsely accused an academic of supporting Hamas in an official late-night tweet. What do you make of this? The fact that this money has not come out of her own pocket, I think, is the thing that people are confused over. Well, there's just a lot to sort of pick through here. A, I think anybody who's a politician should not be sort of doing late-night tweeting. I think just put the phone down at that point. It's a very, very bad thing to do. It leads to no good. <laughs> but I do think it's quite rich having had a budget. We've been talking about waste. We've got to crack down on public sector waste. Mm -hmm. Now, public money has been spent on basically libelous tweets that shouldn't have been made in the first place. It's such good advice, though. Never never to tweet, you know, kind of after six o'clock. I have to stop myself from sending out streams of abuse as I sit in my taxi, uh -huh. swinging me <laughs> home at night. Usually, usually, about, usually about colleagues. I feel uh, like there should be a breathalyzer uh, on the phone. <laughs> no, no, please, let's, let's not do that. Ayesha, Andrew, it has been a pleasure having you both back in. Lovely to see you, and we will see you again very soon. Uh, but for us, well, coming up next, this is an important story. An investigation has revealed the deadly fallout from the double life of the IRA spy, Freddie Scapatici. That's next.
The government and the provisional IRA have both been heavily criticised by an investigation into the top spy inside the terror group. Freddy Scapatici, known by his codename Steak Knife, headed an IRA unit whose job was to kill informants. Until now, defence and security officials claimed his actions saved hundreds of lives, but today's report said that was a comparison rooted in fables and fairy tales. It is an incredible and barbaric story. We will start back in 2003, when the allegations first emerged. Mr Scapatici arranged a press conference in Northern Ireland and read a statement to journalists. Uh, just my statement basically is that I am Freddie Scapatici. I'm sitting here today with my solicitor. I'm telling you I'm not guilty of any of these allegations. I have not left Northern Ireland since I was challenged by reporters on Saturday night. Nobody had the decency to ask me if any of these allegations were true and why the police had not come to, to question me about these allegations. Well, for the latest edition of the Sky News Daily podcast, I have been discussing the story of Freddy Scapatici with our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins. It shines a light on that period of history we describe as the dirty war between the IRA and British intelligence. The so-called nutting squad is considered responsible for somewhere in the region of 35 deaths during right. the Troubles. Uh, Freddy Scapatici himself was linked to some 18 murders, but of course he never faced trial for them and he's taken many of his secrets to the grave. He initially denied, of course, that he was steak knife, that he was an informant, but very quickly departed Belfast and entered the witness protection programme in the north of England. And so I'm not sure we'll ever get to the bottom of exactly what his role was, but it was a dual role, working within the IRA, providing information to British intelligence, and I think what this report does is beg the question, how many times did British intelligence turn a blind eye to murder for the sake of its own cause? What we do know of Freddy Scapatici, of, of Steak Knife, are some of the details of the crimes that were committed, the brutality that was often meted out and on occasion to people who were entirely innocent. Yes, and the families of those who were murdered have found this incredibly difficult. They were, as their lawyer today said, at the end of the queue in terms of the pursuit of truth and justice, because they've lived, in some cases, for decades with the stigma of their relative having been labelled a traitor, a tout, as they describe it, in Northern Ireland. I spoke uh, to a woman who has been working very closely as a counsellor with 20 of those families, and she says it is one thing to be murdered by the other side, by the enemy, because then your own community rallies around you and supports you. But when you're murdered by your own, then no one comes to knock your door and offer support. And the labelling of their loved ones as informants resulted in them being dehumanised. That's the word she used. So it's been very, very painful, this process. And they were brutally murdered. Mm. And it is interesting that John Boucher reserved his strongest language in this report for the provisional IRA, describing them as brutal and evil and calling on the Republican movement to acknowledge that it was wrong and to apologise for it. Uh, David Blevins there. And if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to the latest Sky News Daily podcast. Sky's senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, and I taking a very deep look at what we know about the British spy codenamed Steak Knife and the murders he'd been linked to whilst embedded in the IRA during the Troubles. You can subscribe to The Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, but coming up in the sport, as well as the big fight tonight, there's also a big clash at the top of the Premier League this weekend. We're about to preview Liverpool versus Man City. I think that when we're looking across history, that empires are a fundamental part of our history. Uh, they were the fundamental part of world order. And if we're thinking about this within the wider context, you know, King George III himself in the 1750s argued for uh, the abolition of slavery. He argued that it was immoral. We know that Queen Victoria, for example, was incredibly uh, kind to the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. And so ultimately, when we're looking throughout history, it's very difficult to actually make these specific arguments for who should be paying reparations 
reparations. I'm half Moroccan. Should the Moroccan kingdom uh, be paying reparations to Cornish people for, for the Barbary slave trade? It's very difficult to actually pin down where these arguments should be lying and actually where this, these reparations or these apologies should, should be kept. King Charles, this is the man who is obviously head of state, head of the Church of England, and ultimately decided to commission the first monarch to commission a report into the royal family's links into the slave trade. So this is a man who was very much centred around equality, right? So this is a good thing. Um, in terms of who should pay it, that's ultimately your point. Well, it starts with King Charles, let's just be clear. Um, the monarchy advocated and benefited from the slave trade. We're talking 3.4 million people that were transported from the African continent into the Americas and the Caribbean, 450,000 of which died during the process. Monarchy advocated and benefited from that. We also have the fact that the slave owners were compensated, so people like you, people like me, paid as taxpayers for the slave owners' uh, a declaration or agreement that was sorted out 400 years ago in the past. King Charles is not personally responsible. Nobody today is personally responsible for the slave trade. And, and, I, and I hear your point, and I hear the fact that, you know, racism still exists today. And, and ma many, many of the institutional difficulties that we see today stem from these historical grievances. Yes, thank you. However, thank you. However, however nobody today caused the slave trade. Yeah. Nobody alive today yeah. financially benefits from the slave trade today. And so I think it's incredibly, I, I think, uh, misingenuous to actually look at these arguments and actually say that we can trace back exactly who benefited, where benefited. But we can. Where, but no, we cannot. We can. uh, welcome back. Uh, Sunday sees Liverpool hosting Manchester City in a big game at the top of the Premier League. As you can see, uh, Teddy is back with us. Um, Teddy, is, is, is this... The title showdown. Because, frankly, I've lost count of the number of articles <laughs> I read this afternoon suggesting that it was. Well, it's been the top two for the past six, hasn't it? Really, for the most most part, City have won five of those, but Liverpool got over the line in 2020. As Jurgen Klopp's been saying, quite often there's been a point gap where Liverpool have had a scintillating season, but City have just topped them. The only yeah, caveat to that, as you mentioned to me before we came on air, is the fact that Arsenal play Brentford in the evening kickoff on Saturday, live on Sky Sports. And if they win, they go top of the table. And if the game at Anfield on Sunday is a draw, which may not be an outlandish prediction given yeah. the one earlier in the season that the Etihad was a 1-1 draw then Arsenal will be top at the end of the weekend with 10 games to play although despite them winning seven games in a row I think scoring 31 goals in total no one's really given them a chance just because it's been Liverpool and City for so long and so and Klopp and Guardiola for so long. So, so, so who is the momentum with and I, and I know we're looking at pictures of the men there I mean this is this is it hasn't a feel of the an end of an era doesn't it with Klopp off at the end of the season this the last time, last time potentially that these two could be shaking hands after 90 minutes. Yeah, you think about the great rivalries, don't you? In the Premier League era, certainily from mm. from 1992 to 93, it was Wenger against Ferguson in the 90s and the early noughties, and then you had Jose Mourinho against Ferguson after that. And it seems like for for a long time, Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp have been going head to head. And I think, in a sense, Jurgen Klopp saying unequivocally that Pep Guardiola is the best coach in the world. But I suppose for for Guardiola, he'll know there will always be an asterisk because people will know that Klopp has had less resources mm. in his time as a manager at Borussia Dortmund and at Liverpool and had great success. So I think perhaps this will be an opportunity. We said they could meet in the FA Cup. They're still both going strong in that competition. Man City have Newcastle, Liverpool go to Manchester United, which isn't as scary as it once was for, for Liverpool to do that. So there's potential for a, a final decider between the two, but certainly this would be a great signatory, not only for the title, but perhaps for their, their rivalry. Uh, but but we've, we've mentioned them already. Why does everyone just immediately rule out Arsenal? I mean, is it, what, is it form going into the last part of the season? Is it just the fact that it's been Chelsea-Liverpool, Chelsea-Liverpool, Chelsea-Liverpool? I think I, I think it's been the Liverpool Manchester City thing in recent times. Sorry, I think, Chelsea, uh, okay, yeah, exactly. Chelsea, well, it, it was Chelsea Liverpool Pep's a while, while ago, but it's um, it's, it's it's the fact I think they've been on a scintillating run since they went on a holiday to Dubai mm. and a little winter break. They've won seven games straight, but I think it's because two years ago, if you remember, they were in the top four, had a bit of um, a, a Devon Lock collapse, and then last season, obviously, they were top of the table for so long. I think they got forty nine points mm. the first half of the season. They're on for nearly a hundred points, but then just capitulated a little bit in the second half. Manchester City were sensational, but perhaps a sense, a sense that because they haven't won the title in 20 years, you still go with the, those horses with recent form, which is Man City and Liverpool. But as we say, if they split the points on Sunday, Arsenal win this weekend, they'll have their noses in front. Well, for the sake of my producer, who's a big Arsenal fan, uh, let's, let, let, let's hope that that 
doesn't happen yet, actually. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> find out about the rest of the sport. Uh, you've got plenty. I have. Busy one. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need to hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Allison, Rebecca Welsh and Sunny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing, with new refs coming through having people to aspire to. The organisation BAM Ref was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage, uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16 year olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of colour when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play this Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality Teddy thank you time for the weather Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. And I'm afraid to report that the weather is turning more unsettled and showery this weekend, and a brisk easterly wind will make it feel pretty chilly too. Uh, for most places, it's a breezy but dry evening. Thicker clouds bringing some patchy rain or drizzle towards the northeast, and outbreaks of showery rain down in the far southwest. Outbreaks of rain in the Channel Islands, Cornwall and South West Ireland will spread northeast overnight into much of England and Wales with mostly cloudy skies elsewhere and a moderate to fresh easterly wind. The showers will continue to spread northwards across the UK and Ireland through Sunday, accompanied by some pretty brisk easterly winds. It will be chilly and cloudy for most, although some brighter spells are likely for South East England and North West Scotland. Temperatures getting as high as 12 degrees. Now, some heavier showers are indeed possible across parts of South West England, Wales and South East Ireland. High spring tides will bring the possibility of flooding. There will be further showers or longer spells of rain on Sunday with some heavy and possibly thundery downpours. Still rather cold, but not as windy as Saturday. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Coming up in the final hour of Friday night, an investigation concludes the activities of a British spy at the top of the IRA led to more lives being lost than saved. Welcome back to Friday Night with Neil Patterson. Coming up in the final hour of the show, has President Biden done enough to prove to the American people that he deserves another four years in the White House? We'll be live in Washington for the fallout from the State of the Union address. But first, the headlines this hour. More lives lost than saved. The findings of a damning report into Steak Knife, the British agent acting as a spy inside the provisional IRA. Reports of deaths on the ground after parachutes failed to open on a Gazan airdrop. The Education Secretary comes out swinging. As Gillian Keegan says, she'd be happy to punch an Ofsted inspector. Hello from Hollywood. Well, I'll be joined by a British special effects supervisor who has no fewer than three nominations at this Sunday's Oscars. Plenty more to come this hour from our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer, who you just saw. She'll be taking us through all the runners and riders ahead of Sunday's Oscars. Will Bradley Cooper finally bake his duck? The Maestro star nominated 12 times without ever winning. And will Oppenheimer sweep the, sweep the board, as the bookies are suggesting, or are we in for a surprise or two? Uh, the top film critic Amy Nicholson will also be joining us live from Universal Studios in Hollywood. Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. An investigation into a British mole inside the IRA has concluded that his actions probably resulted in more lives being lost than saved. Freddy Scapatici, codenamed Steak Knife, headed an IRA unit whose job it was to kill informants. But an investigation found strong evidence of very serious criminality by him and criticised the security services for failing to protect those at risk. Our senior island correspondent David Blevin sent this report from Belfast. This is Freddy Scapatici, an IRA enforcer turned British spy, the golden goose of agents, according to one defence chief. 
but a seven-year investigation found that more lives were lost than saved by the mole they codenamed Steak Knife, a damning indictment of intelligence gathering. It put lives at risk. It left those on the front line exposed and let down and it fostered a maverick culture for some where agent handling was sometimes seen as high stakes, dark art and was practised off the books. The report calls on the UK government and the Republican movement to apologise, the onus falling on the First Minister. I am sorry for all the lives lost during the conflict without exception. Regrettably, the past cannot be changed or can, cannot be undone. Neither can the suffering, the hurt or the political violence of conflict be disowned by Republicans or indeed by any other party to the conflict. Scabatici ran the IRA's so-called nutting squad, rooting out alleged informants for torture and murder. Unmasked in 2003, he denied the claims. I'm telling you I'm not guilty of any of these allegations but couldn't escape the headlines in Belfast and entered witness protection in England, where he died last year. Freddy Scavatici exemplified the dirty war between the IRA and British intelligence, a murky world of espionage where some turned a blind eye to murder, dark secrets that Steak Knife has taken to his grave. Sandra Peake, who works with bereaved families, says they live with the shame of having their loved ones labelled traitors. I mean, I've often said, David, that when your loved one is killed at the hands of the, of the other community, support is often there. But when your loved one's killed at the hands of people within your own community and with a label, it becomes a stigmatised death. And that's something which is very difficult for families to deal with. A lawyer for relatives says it's clear the state and IRA conspired together to murder. Today's report presents as a damning indictment on the state. The staggering takeaway message is that the state could have and should have intervened to save lives. That this didn't happen is legally and morally reprehensible. And the 200 pages leave one question unanswered. How much has changed in terms of how British intelligence operates now? David Blevins, Sky News in Belfast. Uh, now, there are conflicting reports tonight about the ongoing aid drops into Gaza. The United States has denied claims that as many as five people died after a parachute failed to open during the latest international operation. All this as the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, confirmed that the UK will be involved in an American-led operation to build a temporary port in Gaza and open a sea corridor from Cyprus. The World Food Programme says hunger has reached catastrophic levels in the north of Gaza, where children are dying of hunger-related diseases. The young and the old are the most affected, with one in six children under the age of two suffering from acute malnutrition. Currently, around 150 trucks are entering the Strip each day, but the World Food Programme says a minimum of 300 are needed to meet people's most basic needs. At the moment, aid can only be brought in through two crossings in the south of Gaza, Rafa and Kerem Shalom, with small amounts of aid being dropped by plane. The new plan will see the Cypriot port of Larnaca become a logistics hub for aid from around the world, with a temporary port built by the Americans in Gaza, likely near the current one in the north of the Strip. Sky's Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle has the detail. A week ago... Ten-year-old Yazan Al-Kafana was being comforted by his mother at a hospital in Rafa. His face is gaunt, his eyes and cheeks sunken in hunger. He's almost too weak to cry out, but the pain is clear on his face. Three days later, Yazan died, another victim of malnutrition in Gaza. <laughs> I lost my son due to malnutrition, due to the circumstances we're going through in Gaza. What are you expecting from a sick child living in such conditions? How can he get better? America's plan to bring aid into Gaza by sea is another sign of growing frustration with its ally Israel and the prospect of widespread famine. One option could be something like this, a floating pontoon stretching some distance offshore into deeper waters and away from the threat of fighting on land. This is from a US exercise a few years ago, but experts say that it would take weeks to get it up and running. 
it is a medium-term solution to an immediate crisis. I think it will take at least an, a couple of weeks, um, perhaps even uh, four weeks, six weeks. Um, it's, it's not that easy to get these. Um, I think it will be mostly floating devices with anchors that you want to put there in front of, uh, of the coast. The aid will need to be received in a secure zone and it will need organizations to distribute it to avoid scenes like these. Britain has now announced its involvement. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was in Cyprus today to inspect the port at Larnaca and said that a ship would sail to Gaza imminently. Food was being loaded up with the aim to land up to 200 pallets a day on Gaza's beaches. Despite all the challenges, and this is truly inspiring, we are now very close to the opening of the corridor, hopefully this Saturday, this Sunday. And I'm very glad to see that an initial pilot operation will be launched today. Aid drops continued over Gaza today, but it is inefficient and risky. Multiple people were reportedly killed in the north when a parachute malfunctioned, turning desperately needed aid into a dangerous projectile. Land crossings are by far and away the best way to get aid into Gaza in the quantities needed. But the international community says Israel must still do more. The chances of premature babies surviving in Gaza now is slim. They're kept alive in the few incubators still working, but their mothers are often unable to feed them, to malnourish themselves. Outside this small, rare bubble of hope, everyone else is fighting for survival. The weakest and smallest, as always, are the most vulnerable. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News. A government advisor has warned that London streets have become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian marches. The counter-extremism commissioner, Robin Simcox, spoke out ahead of another mass rally planned for the capital tomorrow. His comments come after a pro-Palestinian campaigner slashed a painting on display at Cambridge University, as our home editor Jason Farrell reports. A Jewish bakery in North London. They didn't want us to name it, fearful of anti-Semitism. Some customers here, too, say they wouldn't travel into central London on the day of a pro-Palestinian protest. I would not go to London or stay, stay, go in any area that there are pro-Palestinian uh, protesters. I would tell people to avoid central London if they looked all sounded Jewish. Yes, definitely. On the high street in Golders Green, we came across Israel's national police spokesman, Mickey Rosenfeld, in the UK to talk to officials here about Jewish security in Europe. The threats have increased, but not just here in England and in London. The threats have increased uh, all across uh, Paris, mm. as well as in uh, Germany and other areas uh, such as uh, Brussels, where there is an increase of uh, pro-Palestinian uh, protests which are taking place, and that is something which should be worrying both to the local governments and communities, as well as security forces. Another large pro-Palestinian protest will flow through London streets on Saturday. And the extremist czar, Robin Simcox, says this is turning central London into a no-go zone for Jewish people. But Hackney MP Diane Abbott posted on X, time to nail these lies about Jews being frightened to come into London on pro-Palestinian march days, adding pictures showing Jewish people on the marches. Ahead of the Saturday demonstration, feminist groups were raising their voices for the women of Gaza to mark International Women's Day. The people on the street are there because human beings are being slaughtered and murdered, starved to death. Uh, no aid is allowed in, no agreement on a ceasefire. The UK government is uh, giving Israel arms and weapons. So instead of, like, they're trying to shift focus on what they're doing and what they fail to do and then link it up to a specific religion. A group called Palestine Action shared a video on social media of a demonstrator vandalising a painting of Lord Balfour at Cambridge's Trinity College. 
As Foreign Secretary, he'd signed the Balfour Declaration in 1917, favouring the establishment in Palestine of a national home for Jewish people. Some groups involved in all kinds of protests will be waiting in anticipation for a move by the government next week to change the definition of extremism, which could include anyone promoting an ideology that undermines British values. It's absurd, the comments that are coming out of the Conservative Party with Rishi Sunak standing there trying to undermine the democratic process, the democratic right of people to protest against a genocide. It's not yet clear who the new definition will affect or the impact it will have, but it's likely to be another factor in this debate for weeks to come. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Now, the Education Secretary has said she would like to punch a group of Ofsted inspectors. Speaking at an education conference, Gillian Keegan said she'd been told by one school just how rude inspectors could be. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say, I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said, they told me how the officer, had, you know, their officer experience had gone, and I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. I mean, you expect people to be rude to you when you're a politician. You kind of sign up for that. But, you know, when you're kind of trying to run a school and educate children and change lives, you don't expect somebody to come in and not be respectful. I our political correspondent Tamara Cohen is in Westminster. Good to see you again, Tamara. I I'm just wondering, is there anyone other than Ofsted inspectors that the Education Secretary would like to thump? Yes, she said she was shocked by what she heard about the Ofsted inspectors. I think some of the head teachers in that room were a bit shocked by the Education Secretary's uh, comments there. And we've had some, some outraged reaction from unions. We've heard from uh, the FDA union, which represents senior civil servants, saying it's completely unacceptable for her to say that. They said, imagine the outcry if a civil servant had threatened to punch a minister who they found to be disrespectful. We've also heard from the Unison Union's Mike Short uh, saying clearly Ofsted can and should be improved, but making light of violence in schools when staff are increasingly likely to face an assault, they said, is in very poor taste and pointed out that Ofsted inspectors are already dealing with a great deal of hostility. Now, she was speaking at this conference obviously in the context of the big reforms which Ofsted have acknowledged they need to make uh, following the tragic suicide of the head teacher, Ruth Perry. And Gillian Keegan uh, was, according to sources close to her, making a light-hearted remark intended uh, to show that she was on the side of the teachers and head teachers who were having a difficult time and uh, having difficulties recruiting and retaining people. It's not clear which school she went to, but it was a school she visited in her constituency during her time as Education Secretary and heard remarks being made in a tone which she said uh, she found shocking. But I think certainly for some of those in the audience, it was the Education Secretary's uh, comments which were pretty shocking. We've also heard from uh, Labour's Bridget Phillipson, who said that she should focus on reforming Obsted and not on punching working people. The, actually, the new boss of Ofsted, uh, Martin Oliver, was actually in the audience and gave a speech also at the conference. Tamara, thanks very much indeed. Now, stars, writers, directors and, of course, their entourages, well, they're all heading for Hollywood for this weekend's Oscars. And several nominees could make Oscar history if they win a statue on Sunday night. Uh, as the person at Sky News who looks most like a Hollywood star, I was asked to attend, but instead I nominated our arts and entertainment correspondent, Katie Spencer, who's live at Universal Studios. Katie. It's very hot here, Neil, and my diamond shoes are pinching, but, but I'm trying my best bravely to, uh, to carry on. Look, we're here on the Universal lot where they make more TV shows and films than anywhere in the world. You can see some of the sound stages over there. It's an incredibly exciting and buzzy atmosphere to be here, because in Hollywood, of course, it's the heart of filmmaking. And whereas you and I, Neil, would be perfectly content with perhaps one Oscar nomination in our lifetime, I'm joined now by a man, Neil Colbolt, who is a special effects supervisor who has not only won two Oscars within his career, he's nominated this year for three within the same category for best visual effects. Three! Were you even surprised by, by that? You've been busy. Yes, I was very, <laughs> very surprised at that, yes. As each one came up, I thought the first one was yes, and the second Did one it? was yes, <laughs> and then the third one I was like, 
Just <laughs> jaw drop. <laughs> You've won two already for Gladiator and Gravity. Yes. Nominated this year for, let's go through, Napoleon, Mission Impossible and The Creator, the Creator as well. Yes. They're all incredibly different films as well. I mean, that, that, it just shows how varied a job you have, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, incredibly different. You know, it's like all the different genres, different directors, you know, and it's and very different effects as well. You know, some very heavy practical, some very heavy visual with practical elements. Well, you, you can't give away too much on uh, the Gladiator sequel, which you've been working on at the moment, but yes. Ridley Scott again, that is, and Ridley Scott, of course, for Napoleon. Yes. What's he like to, to work with? Incredibly quick as a film. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the man's a genius. He's, you know, he's a machine. He just, you know, he, he storyboards everything by, by hand, you know, does it himself, and so you know exactly what you, what you need to do, and, and his vision comes across. I mean, with Napoleon, were you involved in things like sort of firing... Uh, weapons at the pyramids and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, then, we, we did all the cannons, we did yeah. the guillotine, so we cut uh, Mary Antoinette's head, head off, you know, we did wow. the whole, the whole, all the battles, all the explosions, loads of smoke, Ridley likes some smoke in his, uh, in his shots. And we have to talk about Mission Impossible as well, because for me, that was one of the standout action films of, of last year as well. The train scene. Were you involved in the train scene? Yes, like from start to finish. I How mean, long we, did that take to Oh, conceive? it was probably a year in the making. You know, the, the building of the train, we built it from the ground up. You know, we just had some drawings that, or pictures that we then designed, the wheels, every, everything. You know, the, an 80-ton train, which then had to go on a railway in Norway... Uh, on a public railway, and then we built a bridge and a railway section, a railway track in a I mean, quarry. Do, the, do these filmmakers ever come to you and you think, well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm even going to be able to do that, but somehow you you do do it? Well, I, yeah, I never, I never say no to start with. <laughs> That's uh, why you've got all these Oscar yeah. nominations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it must be hugely satisfying to then have worked so hard on a project like Mission Impossible and see the finished result of something like that train scene. It's absolutely amazing, and I'm so glad for Mission as well because, you know, there's lot of, lots of films that have gone by in the past and for now, for it's finally to get recognition for the visual and special effects is amazing, and the sound as well. Yeah. I mean, for, you're, you're nominated three out of the four within the category. Your chances are very high, Neil, then. Are you sort of yes, going I, there in terms of thinking of speeches? or? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I, I never count your chickens before they're hatched. That's what I, my motto, so you never know. What have you done with the other two Oscars? What were you, I mean, you oh, they're, they're pride of place. Trick, we do, yeah, yeah, I do, yes, yeah. <laughs> they're just they're sitting on the, on the mantle, please. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we think of the stars when we talk about the Oscars, but actually we should be in incredibly proud in Britain, shouldn't we? Because there's so many behind-the-scenes geniuses like yourself who are doing such good work. Are you very sort of proud that there's a British sort of twist? To yeah, no, I'm so really proud. Doing? I'm so proud to represent the, the, the UK in, in, a, in an event like this. It's absolutely amazing. And to do it for three movies is, is just out of this world. I just want to know if they, when they sort of cut to you when they're reading out who the winner is, are you going to be there in the three boxes? Yeah, well, I've got three it? jackets. So I'm Great, just, I'm okay. just going to keep changing, changing them hats. over. Yes, that's it. Yeah, changing <laughs> <a> moustache. <laughs> Best of luck. Look, it's so good to meet you. And, Thank and you very can't much. Can't wait to see whether or not you end up winning. Surely the chances are very high, Neil. That'd um, be nice. You're going to bat the other Neil for this Sunday. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, do you know what? I have to say, three out of four nominations. If he doesn't win it, I'm going to send him. I'm going to send him a card myself. Uh, Katie, we'll have much more from you at half past, of course. Uh, stick with us, though. Coming up before that, uh, Joe Biden gave a feisty performance, but has his State of the Union speech really shaken up the presidential race? We'll be discussing that next. I'm Martha Kalner, and I'm Sky's US correspondent, based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? 
Jeffrey said, you aren't a Tigilin, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Welcome back. Joe Biden has said freedom and democracy are under attack as he gave one of the most important speeches of his presidency. In his State of the Union address, the US president appealed to Congress to continue supporting Ukraine against Russia, saying that history is watching. Well, after months of criticism about his ability to serve another term, President Biden joked about his own age. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> When you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. Our U.S. correspondent James Matthews joins us from Washington. Good to see you, James. So, so what was the state of the State of the Union address from you, from where you are sitting, James? Look, we have an awful long way to go before uh, polling for the, the next in, well, the next uh, occupier of the White House, and lots can happen. But those who were looking for Joe Biden to slip up last night might have been a bit disappointed. I think you're right, uh, Neil, and I think we see that in the fallout and reaction, particularly in the ranks of. The Republicans, if you looked at the cutaways, the audience shots last night, Republicans, his opponents, were grim-faced, checking their phones, rolling their eyes. We didn't see the kind of animation we saw last year from the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, and so on. And in terms of their response, they criticised Biden for being too political. Today, trending 
on X, formerly Twitter, is the notion that Joe Biden was on some sort of drugs last night. Biden will like that. His strategists will enjoy that because nobody is talking about mental sharpness. No one's talking really about him being too old for the presidency because I think he addressed that last night, certainly in the eyes of Democrats. He addressed it in his endurance, his volume, strength of voice, certainly, and also in his ability to interact and engage with an audience that at times was hostile. You know, they did try to shout him down. Um, he showed an ability to deal with that, deal with the heckling. Uh, also showed a bit of stagecraft, I thought. Um, there was this whole issue of, say, her name, uh, Lakin Riley, who's a student who was murdered by a Venezuelan uh, immigrant who had entered the country uh, illegally. And Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, was holding up a badge, say her name. She shouted, say her name. And at that point, Biden, you might recall, held up a badge with the name and addressed the student's parents directly. He misspoke her name, said Lincoln Riley. But, you know, he largely uh, was on it last night. It wasn't 100% perfect. But certainly speaking to Democrats today, as I have been, um, they're quite happy. They say, in fact, in the words of one man I spoke to, he said, look, uh, I've never quite seen him as president before last night. That was everything I wanted in terms of performance, but also in terms of substance on the issues. James, do, do, you know me. I'm dead polite, and I, I never like to correct correspondence live on air. But when you say that no one was talking about Joe Biden's age, I, I can I can mention one name, and I think you probably know who it is. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, didn't uh, sorted out the nomination at Super Tuesday. I'm just wondering how his campaign is going at the moment. Nikki Haley has has dropped out, of course, but she did take a chunk of the Republican vote, didn't she? Uh, yes, she uh, yes she did, and. Neil, I do know you, you know me, and when I say nobody, <laughs> I'm talking relatively old French. But, <laughs> but no, really, I mean, today, had he screwed up last night, then, you know, everything would have been uh, exploding in terms of finger-pointing, uh, and that would have endorsed the view among many that Biden isn't fit for the job, many inside the Democratic Party. There was that poll, wasn't there, last week? More than 60% who supported him last time think he's too old to be effective. But, yeah, Trump has his troubles. He, he had his triumph this week, clearly. He is the Republican nominee. But Nikki Haley, she did have and does have that, that rump of support. She didn't win many states, but consistently she scored a significant percentage, significant enough for Trump to worry about. And in her speech when she stepped down, um, there was a lack of endorsement of Donald Trump. He will not have liked that. She also, though, spoke about um, darkness, hatred politics. Now, she didn't mention Trump by name, but that was clearly who she was referring to. And that's certainly how it would have sounded to people who have backed her and uh, because of their opposition to Trump. I was in Charlottesville, Neil, during the week after she stepped down. We went there, we thought, well, where in Virginia do people back Haley? Charlottesville. Where's relevant to Biden versus Trump? Charlottesville. That's where there was white supremacist riots in 2017. And that's when Trump said there were good people on both sides. Biden said, right, on the back of that quote, I'm going to run for the presidency. So the right place to go to gauge where the Haley vote will now funnel towards. And I have to tell you, the Haley voters that we spoke to, you might have heard them on Sky, were emphatically against Donald Trump. One man said, I wouldn't trust him to be my dog catcher. Another said, I wouldn't have him in my house in the same room as my wife and my daughter. So that's the kind of sentiment harboured by Haley supporters. Difficult to see that that is going to gravitate towards Donald Trump. And the thing about Biden last night, very quickly, um, it's all about the messenger and the message. I think last night he inspired confidence in the messenger. He will hope that that enables people to focus on the message, his message. Busy times ahead for you, James. We'll let you crack on. Thanks very much indeed. Time for us to take a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
And it's turning more unsettled and showery this weekend with a brisk easterly wind which will make it feel quite chilly as well. Now, for most places, it is a breezy but dry evening with thicker cloud bringing some patchy rain or drizzle towards the northeast, some outbreaks of showery rain in the far southwest. Outbreaks of rain in the Channel Islands, Cornwall, and southwest Ireland will spread northeast overnight into much of England and Wales with mostly cloudy skies elsewhere and a moderate to fresh easterly wind. The showers will continue to spread northwards across the UK through Saturday, accompanied by those brisk easterly winds. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Do stick with us. Coming up after the break, we are certainly looking forward to this weekend's Oscars and asking which of the favourites is actually worth watching. Welcome back. Oscar weekend is here. With that in mind, we are going to discuss, well, which of this year's nominees is actually worth watching. Uh, let's look ahead to Sunday night's ceremony. We're joined by our arts and entertainment correspondent, Katie Spencer, of course, uh, but also the film critic, Amy Nicholson, both of them uh, there at Universal Studios in California. Ladies, good to see both of you. Um, let's start by talking about who won't win the big awards. Uh, let's start, of course, Best Actress. Where's that going? 
Best Actress um, is an interesting one, isn't it? So far, uh, if you look at things like the BAFTAs, it has really been Emma Stone's year for poor things, hasn't it? Up against Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Mew, uh, Moon, Annette Bening, uh, Kerry Mulligan, Sandra Hula. Who, who will we thinking, though, for this? Oh, it's a tough category. I'm personally rooting for Emma Stone. You know, to do that performance, to chart somebody's intellectual and mental growth, you know, over the course of a film, shoot it out of order. Astounding performance. But I do wonder if Emma Stone's almost so good they might hold it against her and be like, she's going to be back. Maybe this is Lily Gladstone's year. Maybe this is Sandra's year. But also, it would be such a moment if Lily Gladstone won, though, wouldn't it? Because it would be the first Native American uh, actress to win. You could imagine that that's going to be a hell of a speech that she would give. It really would be. It would really be a moment. I mean, this is one of those categories where I feel like that is the trickiest part of it. You know, are they going to go for history or are they going to go yeah. for, like, the performance that just, whew, made such an impact? I know. I suspect that it might go a different way than, than we're thinking and perhaps not mm -hmm. Emma Stone. But we'll see on Sunday, won't we? We'll see. Yeah, you, you, you certainly will. But I, I have to say, when it comes to, to the Best Actor uh, nominations, well, the Best Actor winner, I should say, is that, is that one in the bag? Do we know where that one's going? Because I think I've got a rough idea. I do think that's in the bag. I don't see how Killian Murphy loses this one, to be honest, to be honest. He's really got the momentum behind him. I mean, I'm personally really happy that Jeffrey Wright is up there for American Fiction. I think that performance is fantastic. I know we got a, we got a Giamatti girl over here. Oh, I love Paul Giamatti <laughs> in The Holdovers. He was absolutely terrific. And again, he's one of those actors where he's just so good, you kind of assume at some stage he, w he would have won an Oscar, but no. But I, I think it's Killian Murphy's year, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's a terrific performance. Just the, the uncanniness of how much he looks like Robert Oppenheimer as well. It was a role that was just made for him. Yeah, got to say, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Paul Giamatti as well. If you've not seen Shoot 'em Up, please go and watch it. It's a fantastic film, that. Uh, but let's, let's move, though. Who's going to be taking on Best Supporting Actress? Again, a, a, a competitive field, do we think? Yeah, supporting actress. I mean, we, we, we've got a Brit in there in the form of em Emily Blunt, who's nominated for Oppenheimer. But really, do we just think it, it, this has to be Divine Joy Randolph's year, who's nominated for the Paul Giamatti yeah. film, the, the Holdovers? It absolutely has to be Divine Joy Randolph's year. I mean, it's amazing. Like, she really only broke onto the scene about five years ago with Dolomite Is My Name. And she is just such a powerhouse. She's amazing in this. For, for those that haven't seen it, it's a terrific performance that she gives, isn't it? Just the, the, the weight of this... Um, um, she's a, a school cook that is grieving the, the loss of her son, and it's just, it's, it's entirely deserving of, of being up there for best support. It absolutely actually. is. I mean, her and Giamatti on the screen, he's just this rampaging bull. She's got so much nuance. Her, her performance really shifts from scene to scene. It's really muted, and I, re I think people are appreciating that about yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating performance, and I've got to say, I think I agree. She's, she's one to watch in the, in the future for, for, for Best Actress, I'd suggest. But, but how about Best Supporting Actor? We've done the women, what about the men? Again, some names there that, frankly, I would suggest should have won an Oscar before now as well. Well, the, the, the fun win there would be if we had a complete curveball and suddenly out of nowhere Ryan Gosling won for Barbie. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be good? But, but who do we actually I would be so win? happy if it was Gosling yeah. for Barbie. I would be so happy if it was Rob Buffalo for Poor yeah. Things. I love Mark Ruffalo and Poor Things. So good. It's gonna, I believe, be Robert Downey Jr. because I think people just think he's due. But that makes me sad. I don't think this is his most complicated performance. I don't think there's as much on screen to get him to win. I think it's more of a reward of welcome back to making good films. We're so glad you're not Iron Man anymore. Well, it, he said at the BAFTAs, didn't he, in his speech, that he was just so grateful because many people had, had attributed Christopher Nolan casting him in that role as just resurrecting his career again because it is... You, you see Robert Downey Jr. back on fine form as this very serious actor who, who deserves to be up for awards. He's, he's so much better than superhero <laughs> films, isn't he? Very much. It's hard to begrudge him for that, but also at the same time, Mark Ruffalo was the Incredible Hulk. It's his turn, yeah. too. Come on. <laughs> 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 Wise words from both of you. Look, let's, let's move on to, to, to the very biggest of the awards. And amongst those, you've always got to be talking about Best Director. There, there are a couple of names involved in this one. Uh, one man who I, 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 I... Again, I wonder why he hasn't won an Oscar before now. Uh, who do you think's going to got this one in the bag? Every time a uh, bus goes past us, we slightly lose comms with you. But sorry, we talk about Best Director, aren't we? Um, I, we are. I, I have to say, Christopher Nolan is arguably the one that everyone... Uh, is assuming it's going to win. It's probably going to be him. But can we mention the one woman in there, Justin Trier, Anatomy mm. of a Fall is a oh. terrifically accomplished film, isn't it? It is a really tricky film, and it is so much her film, you know, having, having been the person who also wrote the screenplay for it, too. 
I think the critical darling, the, my little group of people, the film critics, who we never disagree with the Academy completely, we're rooting for Jonathan Glazer in this category. Of course, yeah. Zone of interest. It's a phenomenal achievement technically, structurally. Every little element of it is, is masterful. I do wish Greta Gerwig is up here for Barbie. I do. It's not, it's not, yeah, she's yeah. certainly missing from that category. But you're right, Jonathan Glazer, it's so different what he's done with that film yeah. to, to illustrate the horrors of a concentration camp just through the sort of subtleties of yeah. sound that he uses. But come on, it's Chris, Christopher Nolan. How has he never won an Oscar before? It, it's yeah. Christopher Nolan. It is, it is. But I have to admit, a tiny troll part of me is like, I think he's going to make a better film than Oppenheimer after this. Yeah. Well, I, do we want to blow up the bomb now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I think I agree with you. I don't even think Oppenheimer is his best film, best film thus far, which rather handily allows me to segue into Best Picture Oscar. Which one is going to be winning? Come on, uh, I, I, again. Is it, it's, please tell me it's not going to be Oppenheimer again, is it? Barbie. I think it is. Oh, but uh, I wish it was Barbie. I do wish it was Barbie. I do wish it was Barbie for a few reasons. I mean, one thing is the Academy talks a lot about why don't people care about the Oscars? Why aren't they watching? If you look at it, it's been 20 years since the number one film at the box office was also a Best Picture contender. You know, the last time we had this was the third Lord of the Rings film, where the number one film was actually the person that took home the Best Oscar. Barbie is that movie. Barbie registered this year. It has an impact. I, I, I wish we took it seriously as an Oscar film, but we always go period piece, don't we? But, but you might be the most popular kid in school, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win the mm -hmm. best student in the class, are you? And That's sometimes it counts against you, I think, too. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But I think there's little moments that we're going to see peppered throughout the ceremony that Barbie will, will get its dues, <laughs> particularly when yeah. we see Ryan Gosling performing. I'm just... Oh. Yeah. I mean, I think no matter what happens, when we look back on this year in 10 years, we're going to think about Barbie more than any of the other yes. movies. Absolutely. Uh, briefly, ladies, because we aren't just about to run out of time. Amy, Katie, I mean, in previous years, we have seen other issues dominating the headlines rather than the Oscar winners. I'm thinking of Will Smith, of course. Uh, is there anything that we might be focusing on this year uh, rather than the winners? Well, it, some, oh. Sometimes we get slaps, don't we? Sometimes <laughs> we get unexpected winners that we're not, we're not seeing coming. Um, the protests are the one thing that we, we have been warned by LAPD that we could see um, protesters holding things up a little bit. We have been. We have been. Very much. I mean, LA knows when to seize its moments, you know. Um, it's an election year. Anything could happen. Anything could happen. Yeah. Should be a good one this year, though. Certainly should. Um, Amy? We're going to have to leave it there for time. Amy, yes. thank you very much indeed. Uh, Katie, let down the tyres on that bus uh, when you've got five minutes and have a lovely <laughs> time, both of you, at the Oscars. <laughs> we will thank do. you. Time for the latest sport now. Teddy is standing by. This Sky News Sports Bulletin <laughs> is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually a referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. 
The achievements of Sam Allison, Rebecca Welsh and Sonny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing, with new refs coming through having people to aspire to. The organisation BAM Ref was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage, uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, you still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of color when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't over 200 people accessed the bursary scheme between September and January with more to be added across 13 courses over February Referee courses can cost up to £140, but were lowered to 40 this time round. I want to broaden my knowledge in football and um, in future I wish to have a full-time career in football in some aspect, whether that's refereeing, coaching or whatever. But uh... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Teddy, thanks very much indeed. Uh, coming up next, uh, we'll be revealing how our team covered this week's well, rather underwhelming budget. That's next. I'm Kamali Melbourne, and tonight on the press preview, we'll look at how the papers are covering the war in Gaza as the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says the UK will be part of a US-led initiative to provide aid by sea. While in the UK, a government advisor on extremism says London streets have become no-go zones for Jews during pro-Palestinian protests. There's another big rally planned in the capital tomorrow. And the Metropolitan Police officer charged with the murder of Chris Cabot in 2022 has been named as Martin Blake. We'll see what the papers have to say about that. With me tonight, the PR consultant Alex Dean and the Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. Do join us, if you can, from 10.30 on Sky News. I think that when we're looking across history, that empires are a fundamental part of our history. Uh, they were the fundamental part of world order. And if we're thinking about this within the wider context, you know, King George III himself in the 1750s argued for uh, the abolition of slavery. He argued that it was immoral. We know that Queen Victoria, for example, was incredibly uh, kind to the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. And so ultimately, when we're looking throughout history, it's very difficult to actually make these specific arguments for who should be paying reparations. I'm half Moroccan. Should the Moroccan kingdom uh, be paying reparations to Cornish people for, for the Barbary slave trade? It's very difficult to actually pin down where these arguments should be lying and actually where this, these reparations or these apologies should, should be kept. King Charles, this is the man who is obviously head of state, head of the Church of England, and ultimately decided to commission the first monarch to commission a report into the royal family's links into the slave trade. So this is a man who was very much centered around equality, right? So this is a good thing. Um, in terms of who should pay it, that's ultimately your point. Well, it starts with King Charles, let's just be clear. Um, the monarchy advocated and benefited from the slave trade. We're talking 3.4 million people that were transported from the African continent into the Americas and the Caribbean, 450,000 of which died during the process. Monarchy advocated and benefited from that. We also have the fact that the slave owners were compensated, so people like you, people like me, paid as taxpayers for the slave owners' uh, a declaration or agreement that was sorted out 400 years ago in the past. King Charles is not personally responsible. Nobody today is personally responsible for the slave trade. And, and, I, and I hear your point, and I hear the fact that, you know, racism still exists today. And, and ma many, many of the institutional difficulties that we see today stem from these historical grievances. Yes, thank you. However, thank you. However, nobody today 
caused the slave trade. Yeah. Nobody alive today yeah. financially benefits from the slave trade today. And so I think it's incredibly, I, I think, uh, misingenuous to actually look at these arguments and actually say that we can trace back exactly who benefited, where benefited. But we can. Where, but no, we cannot. We Now, as you may or may not know, this is not the only show I present. You can also find me on the Sky News Daily podcast. This week, our economics editor, Ed Conway, has been helping us break down why some might have found Jeremy Hunt's budget a little, shall we say, underwhelming. Everything is being constrained because the OBR is forecasting 92.8% GDP in 2028-29. Mm. Everything else kind of comes back from that. So the economic tail or the forecast tail is wagging the economic dog or whatever the phrase should be and that's what happened here the chancellor didn't spend much money because he didn't have much headroom mm -hmm. against these fiscal rules and a lot of people and not just conservative mps are going to look at that and say that's crazy that your entire economic policy your vision for what the economy is going to be is determined by these strange kind of pointy headed rules <laughs> and it's not uh, it's not just it's not I just know it's not just you. crazy people who are thinking that it's also kind of a lot of economists look and they say this is not really a sensible way to run an economy and you can hear much more from a very frustrated Ed Conway on the podcast. Uh, still, as part of our budget coverage, we had reporters and presenters up down the country. But it was our business presenter, Ian King, who had the most fun. What do they say about boys and their toys? I'm Ian King in Ipswich at a plant hire company. Its businesses up and down the land wait to see what impact the budget will have on them. I'm in Ipswich at a plant hire company to gauge the reaction of businesses to the budget. And coming up at half past on Business Live with me, Ian King, I'm live in Ipswich at a family-owned plant hire company to gauge business reaction to the budget. Just, just absolutely priceless. Of all the people I thought I'd be able to compare Ian King to, long-distance Clara, not one of them. Uh, time for us to have a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And the weather is turning more unsettled and showery this weekend. A brisk easterly wind will make it feel pretty chilly too. For most places, a breezy but dry evening, with thicker cloud bringing some patchy rain or drizzle towards the northeast, and outbreaks of showery rain in the far southwest. Outbreaks of showery rain in the Channel Islands, Cornwall, Southwestern Ireland. Well, that will spread northeast uh, overnight into much of England and Wales, with mostly cloudy skies elsewhere and a moderate to fresh easterly wind. The showers will continue to spread northwards across the UK through Saturday, accompanied by brisk easterly winds. It will be chilly and cloudy for most, although some brighter spells are likely for southeast England and northwest Scotland. Some heavier showers possible across parts of southwest England and southeast Ireland. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that is your lot for Friday night with Neil Patterson. Coming up next, it is Sky News at 10. Kamali Melbourne is standing by. As for me and the Friday night team, well, we'll see you next week.